Do you hear me? Hi, hi. Good morning. Yeah, we hear uh -huh. you. Good morning. Okay. Fabian, Fabian, if you want, you can uh, pause the recording so that uh, we'll start recording uh, afterwards. Very high energy emissions from uh, Gamma Ray Burst. In the session on Monday, we discussed mostly about uh, the detection and uh, the physical implication of the very recent detection of very high energy emission from Gamma Ray Burst and the prospects for detecting such a component from ground-based air shower array detectors. Today, we will complete this discussion, closing the loop, I should say, discussing first about the high energy emission with the very nice results by Agile and by Fermilat. Then we will complete the theoretical overview of the high energy emission uh, on the prompt and uh, generally on the whole, uh, the, all the physics uh, from the prompt to the afterglow in the high energy part. And secondly, we will uh, then go to the, to the completion of the discussion of the air shower array uh, components with uh, the possibility of uh, discussing what LASO is doing uh, on uh, gamma ray burst. And last but not least, we will discuss about uh, the possibility for CTA to detect uh, the gamma ray burst. So let's get started with the presentation by Alessandro Ursi on Agile uh, results on Gamma Ray Burst. Please, Alessandro, it is your turn, 15 plus 5. I will uh, give you the advice when uh, you miss five minutes. Yeah, OK. Check this out. OK. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, perfect. Yeah, OK. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so first of all, I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this talk about Agile and uh, Gamma Ray Burst. So uh, 13 years of observations. Uh, so, mm, doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so Agile is an Italian space mission uh, launched in 2007 and uh, still operational. And it consists of several detectors. The main detector is the Gamma Ray Imaging Detector Grid, which is composed of a silicon tracker with imaging capabilities here, uh, sensitive up to 50 GV. And the mini-color emitter, with, uh, which is an all-sky monitor with no imaging capabilities, sensitive up to 100 MeV. Uh, above these two detectors, there is an X-ray coded mask, um, superagile, which is sensitive in the X-ray energy range. And all around, we have plastic scintillation panels uh, acting as semantical incidence modulus. So it's useful, it's uh, important to remark here that we have also scientific red meter theta, which are basically the same data acquired by each detector here but sampled with a rougher time resolution of about half a second or one second. So they basically serve to monitor the background rate, the background modulation, but of course they can detect transients as well. So um, some of the most important results of, of Agile, of course, it's a, it's a high energy mission. So it uh, investigates the gamma ray sky, detecting sources and um, it discovered the crop nebula variation, uh, which was thought to be a very stable source in the high energy range. Uh, it discovered an emission above 100 MeV uh, from jets of microquasars, especially in the sickness region. And it detects gamma ray bursts, so uh, it's an active partner of the IPN network for triangulation and for sharing data about GRBs. Uh, it has been a very active follow-up partner for what concerned the detection of gravitational waves during the LIGO Virgo campaign for two and all three runs. And it's one of the major players in the detection of terrestrial gamma ray flashes, which are these uh, high energy emissions produced during thunderstorms on the Earth and escaping to the space. And more recently, last year, it detected together with uh, Integral, Insight, and uh, Conus Wind uh, an X ray pulse coincident with a fast radio burst. So, actually, um, opening up a new way of investigating this, uh, this radio pulses. So just a few points about Agile. After the first two years in a nominal phase, we lost the possibility to point sources in the sky. We are spinning around our uh, sun point in axis, scanning about 80% of the sky every seven minutes. And this could look like a drawback when dealing with fixed sources in the sky, but it's not much of a drawback when dealing with uh, isotropic events, as isotropic trends and such as GRPs. Uh, it experiences a, a low charge particle background modulation because of its very low inclination orbit. Uh, the mini calorimeter has a sub millisecond trigger logic time scale, uh, which makes it very sensitive to short duration transients. And of course, Agile is a high energy mission, so it's mostly focused on the detection of high energy gamma ray bursts. So, just a few words about high energy gamma ray bursts. Simplifying, uh, if we take a look to the spectral energy density here, we can describe a typical spectrum by means of a, of a band model, for instance, but a smoothly joint broken power law. 
And so what happens when uh, emission sensitive, let's say in the X-rays, hard X-ray energy range detects something coming from a GRB and together another emission, another detector detects some high energy photons uh, coming from the same GRB. So it's interesting to see what lies in between. And this region is the one investigated by a Dominic calorimeter. And it's also a region, a spectral region, which is poorly investigated by other space missions. So we have GBM, we have CONSWIM, but it's a very important region of the, of the, of the spectrum, of course. Uh, what could MCAL see in this, in this context? So for instance, it could detect just the right part, let's say the high energy uh, part of the band model. So we can just observe a single power law, in this case, extending up to the highest energies, or we can observe the high energy um, component of the band model plus an extra component, an extra power law or an extra cutoff power law emerging at a, at a certain time or during the prompt phase, extending the spectrum up to the highest energy. Or we can just detect a, a very energetic band model with a peak energy above our uh, lower energy threshold. So let's say above 400 keV. And as I said before, all these extra components could arise uh, simultaneously during the prompt, so suggesting a sort of uh, uh, inner uh, um, uh, origin uh, in, in the inner core for, from inner shocks, or uh, a delayed extended emission resembling a sort of high energy afterglow, so something which is, uh, which uh, uh, is more like uh, outer shocks uh, interacting with the surrounding medium. Uh, so here I focus on the detection of, of the GRBs with MCAL and the rate meters. As I said before, rate meters are here, rate meters of the supraragular index rays, anti coincidence in the X rays, and MCAL. So these two are the same energy range. Uh, the important thing is that these data are a continuous data stream with, a, let's say, a half a second or one second time resolution. On the other hand, we have MCAL data, which are basically, in principle, photon by photon data with four microseconds time resolution, but they are um, acquired um, after a trigger is issued on board. And of course, the data acquisition acquired on board, the duration of this data acquisition depends on, on, the, on the trigger time scale and depends on the onboard configuration. I say this because in recent years, we underwent a lot of telemetry restrictions, which makes us um, uh, less sensitive, let's say, less capable of detecting very long GRBs because we had to reduce the amount of, of uh, mass memory uh, dedicated to these uh, acquisitions here. So, um, so about GRBs detected with MCAL, we have the first catalog released in 2013 concerning the first three years during the so-called pointing phase, uh, 84 GRBs. Here you can see the, the T90 distribution. And here, assuming that we are just observing the high energy component of the band models, basically a, a single uh, power law, a simple power law. Here we have a distribution of the photon index peaking between minus two and minus three. So what happens in the in the last years up to November 2020? Um, let's take a look to the MCAL GRB detection rate. It's not constant in time. So after this first four years, let's say with what I call the golden age, uh, we have uh, of course a reduction of, of detected GRBs. This is, this is to due to telemetry uh, reductions, as I said before. We had more served passages during 2017 during the, the, the LIGO Virgo run. And unfortunately, last year, we had this lack of data due to the COVID pandemic, which severely affected our, our number of, of uh, served passages in Malindi. Uh, so as I said before, out of 503 GRBs triggered by MCAL, we um, completely acquire only 393 GRBs. So in this case, these are the GRBs that are completely acquired. Um, the other 110 GRBs are not useless, of course, because are partial detections, but are partial detection with a four microseconds time resolution. And so in this case could be useful for improving triangulations or sharing data with the IPN. Uh, this is the distribution, 393 GRBs, the T90 distribution by modal distribution. Here uh, I, I show also 27 candidates which are not present in the IPN list. And as you can see here, um, if we take a look to, the, to this distribution, we see that our, our T90 is mostly biased toward short GRBs. So this is because of several reasons. Uh, if we take a look to the GRB duration as a function of the detection year, here, uh, here blue dots represent the events that triggered MCAL and were completely acquired on board, uh, whereas uh, the, the hollow dots here, the white dots, uh, represent events that triggered MCAL but were not completely acquired on board. So you can see here that we didn't lose our sensitivity to uh, also to long duration GRBs, but we lost the capability of detecting, of acquiring data for the whole duration of these events. Due to telemetry restriction, we had to, to reduce the amount of uh, available mass memory. 
uh, we exploited this drawback by improving our detection algorithm and uh, mostly focusing on the detection of short gamma bursts. And this was done especially in view of the LIGO Virgo campaign, because of course short GRBs are the, the most promising candidates to be uh, counterparts of the gravitational waves electromagnetic counterparts of course uh, and it's not so bad also for spinning issues because as i said before we are spinning and so if we're observing a very long event we would observe that under different angles and this requires uh, an interaction with different response matrices which is not so simple to perform um, another important point is the limited energy range of mcal above 400 kb so if we take a look to the t90 distribution of the, of the same sample these are about 200 grbs detected both by mcal and gbm if we take a look to this distribution, we see that MCAL detects T90s, which are slightly shorter than the ones observed by GBM, for instance. Okay, And this is normal because we are just observing a limited portion of the spectrum. So here in this case, I show an event where Super Agile detects this GRB in the X-rays and has a certain duration. And you can see that the same event with the same onset here has a very shorter duration in the MCAL energy range. So this is completely normal that we have a T90 distribution more mostly biased toward short duration events. Um, out of these events, we have 276 GRBs which have a localization, of course, an external localization, because I'm talking about NCAL, which is a non imaging detector. And this localization could be provided by external space missions or by the IPN triangulations. So we can perform out of these events uh, spectral analysis. So again, assuming that we are just observing the high energy component of the band model, so just a single power law, we uh, performed an automatic analysis uh, fitting um, by means of a single power law with a beta for the index. And you can see the distribution peaks at about minus 2.3 here. The fits were performed up to 10 or 50 MeV, depending on the statistics. And what is interesting here is that we have about 77 GRBs with a beta which is greater than minus two. So uh, something which in the new F mu spectrum has a positive slope, so something that should involve a very hard spectrum. Um, moreover, this is not so simple for us because we start from 400 kb, but we could also perform spectral fitting by means of a band model up to uh, for 43 GRBs with a peak energy above uh, 400 kb. And of course, these two data samples represent the highest energy GRB sample of MCAL. And this is uh, the object of, of a forthcoming study here because we are investigating these events one by one, uh, investigating the arising of extra components. When do these extra components arise in the temporal behavior, in the temporal and spectral development? And we also found out that 34 of these events uh, are also observed by LAT. So we have LAT, LAT detection, so they're very interesting. Uh, so this is just a final picture of, of what happened here with the, with the final distribution of these four hundred of these uh, events here in the new catalog, which has uh, recently been submitted. So uh, just a few words about the most important uh, GRBs detected by Agile. Here we have the first event, 08 of 514B, detected we, 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 where the grid instrument detected a GV photon. Um, the first event after egret uh, and this is describable by the same model here by the same band model as you can see you can we can we have here a joint detection by conus wind and the grid fluence perfectly fits with a single band model here um, another very interesting event is this 090510 which is the uh, historical uh, grb thought to be uh, originating by by the, the, the merger of two neutron stars in this case, we have after this very first stages of the prompt phase here, detected by MCAL up to 10 MeV and describable with the cutoff power law, we have the uh, the arrival of grid photons up to 500 MeV with a with, um, harder spectrum, which is fitable with a power law extending up to the highest energies. So a delayed emission up to the highest energies. And this is a very important uh, event. Uh, another event where MCAL data are very useful with this V shape, let's say, is this one, 13108A, where uh, MCAL links very well the constant and GBM data in the X-rays to read and LAT data in the highest energies. And we also had a localization by means of Super Agile here. Of course, we are in 2013, so as I said before, we were spinning, so we have here a strip rather than a bunch of photos, but we could provide localization. Um, Another interesting event was this 180914B, very long, one of the longest GRBs that uh, we observed, uh, more than 200 seconds. This is a light curve by, by Conus Wind, because as I said before, MCAL is not capable of detecting the whole duration, so we just have two limited portions, limited triggers here. 
But it's not MCAL who is very interesting here, it's the grid because we have a bunch of photons arriving exactly at the T0 here, uh, which allowed also localization. We arrived as first with localization. This is a very peculiar for us, so it was very good. Um, and also these photons arrived uh, for thousands of seconds after up to 25 GB. So this is a very, very strong and intense GRB with the grid detection. And the last important GRB that we detected is the, the, the magic GRB in 2019. Uh, unfortunately, it was just outside the grid field of view, but we have very interesting MCAL data here, an MCAL trigger here, lasting 11 seconds, so covering the first five, six seconds of the prompt phase. And we studied this together with Con Swim here, down to 20 kV. Here you can see also the superagular rate meters down to 20 kV up to 60 kV. And as you can see, this is completely fitable with a band model here, so a typical synchrotron emission. But already uh, during the first stages, this is very rare. Uh, at the early stages, we have an, uh, the, the, the rising of this extra power law component, which could be the manifestation, for instance, of a different population of, of accelerated particles emitting synchrotron or, or, or inverse Compton here. And this uh, evolves in a sort of very flat component, a very hard component until we reach a v-shape so there is a separation between the synchrotron component and this v this, and this flat power law here we we, we i inserted here also a um, uh, spectrum from fermi and swift which fits very well inside this transition to the early afterglow and then we have the decreasing uh, uh, a small reflaring here observable just in the x-rays as you can see by superagulum from swim but not retriggered by mcal about 400 kv so there's no trigger here and again, we have also this decrease at, at the very longer uh, times uh, with a break here. We have a break at about 90, 100 seconds, which is also observed by uh, the spikes of integral here, these gray dots. And this is compatible with, uh, with a fireball, which is expanding not in a constant density medium, but in a, in a wind-like steel converse medium with decreasing with R to the minus two. So this, is just, this was just a brief review about the, the, the MCAL uh, GRBs, the actual GRBs. So there is this new catalog now submitted with uh, 503 triggered GRBs and 393 fully acquired GRBs. There are 27 new events that should be studied with other missions. Uh, of course, our sample mostly consists of short duration hard spectrum GRBs. And we have also, as I said before, about 100 GRBs with high energy features. So a high energy spectrum, so a power law with a positive slope in the new FMU spectrum or a band model. Uh, together with associated LAT detection. So this is the object of a forthcoming study. Uh, we have also simultaneous rate meters detections, which allow to perform a sort of broadband observation of these events down to 20 kV up to 100 MeV. And of course, we are also studying grid uh, to see whether there are some high energy photons associated to these events. So uh, thank you. I hope I was on time. Yes, Alessandro, perfect. Uh, you stayed okay. uh, in time, 16 minutes. Thank so, you. Okay. We have uh, some minutes uh, for a question to you. So are there questions to Alessandro? So Fabian, please. Ciao, Alessandro. Um, thanks a lot Hi. for this nice talk. I, I might have missed it, but maybe you can say a few words about the time scale you need to produce alerts so from the detection to the uh, submission of, of GCNs or, or things like that. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, it, it depends on on the on the third passages. Um, actually, in the in, in the best case, it could be something all about uh, let's say. Uh, 20, 30 minutes, because if we if we detect a GRB just before the passage over Malindi, or over the telemetry ground station, uh, of course, there is just a time uh, due to processing, and it's about, I guess, 15 minutes or something like that. So it's very fast. But of course, if, if we detect something just after the passage over Malindi, where we downloaded the data, we have to, to wait another 90 minutes, 94 minutes, before we download the telemetry to the ground station. So it, it's... Um, it's variable, unfortunately. But in the best case, yes, something like 15 minutes just to process all the data, the raw data, and, and, uh, and produce something and deliver something to the community. OK, thanks a lot. You're welcome. OK, thanks, uh, Alessandro, for the answer as well. So is there time for another question, if any?
Okay, so if not, we thank the speaker again. Thanks, uh, uh, Alessandro, for the nice talk. Yeah. And then we'll move to the second uh, topic of today. So Elisabetta will discuss about Fermi, GBM, and LAT results about camera reverse. So Elisabetta, please. Okay, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? <clears throat> Perfect, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I will uh, uh, talk uh, about uh, high energy observation of gamma ray bursts uh, with the Fermi, with the Fermi uh, telescope. Uh, I will uh, talk on behalf of a pretty large collaboration because I will include the results by both the GBM and uh, the LAT instruments. So let's move forward if my slides okay. So you all know what uh, uh, Fermi, what the Fermi mission is. It's uh, taking data since 13 years now. And you know, you we cover the uh, lowest energies with the gamma reverse monitors, scintillator detectors uh, between 8 kV and 40 MeV and the highest energies with the large area telescope uh, from 20 MeV to more than 300 GeV. We have a very large uh, field of view, which is ideal for uh, catching uh, transient events like the uh, gamma reverse, uh, apart from the large energy range, which is also very nice <clears throat> because we can cover the uh, spectrum of a typical GRB uh, in a very in a very nice way, as it is shown in this cartoon in the bottom left. So, uh, starting from gamma uh, from the GBM, uh, uh, let's say highlights. Um, you can see that uh, GBM does not only trigger on gamma ray bursts. Here you have the trigger statistic over the past. Uh, almost 13 years uh, and all of the different colors uh, tell you that there are different transients uh, that are uh, triggering uh, uh, GBM. So we had uh, more than, uh, I mean, at least almost 8,000 or more triggers, so, which means uh, uh, almost twice uh, per day. And we trigger on also soft gamma repeaters, uh, like in the last couple of days, uh, uh, galactic sources, solar flares, uh, TGFs. Uh, so we have really lots uh, of uh, transients populating our trigger statistic, but let's move to gamma ray burst. So the last catalog that we published uh, this year, uh, it's uh, the 10 year trigger catalog uh, following the first, second, third <laughs> catalog. So in this kind of catalog, we, uh, uh, let's say we put uh, the location, the duration, the peak flux and the fluence for each uh, event. Plus uh, we have all of this information on triggering criteria, uh, exceptional operational conditions uh, and uh, all of the other things that you might be interested in. So here you can see the sky map of all the events. Uh, red and black are short and long gamma ray bursts. Uh, you see, if you simply divide the gamma ray burst uh, as usual with the two seconds, uh, let's say, rule, as we know it, we have uh, about 83% of long ones and 17% uh, short ones, which means almost 200 long and 40 short gamma ray bursts per year. As of today, we have 3,100 GBM uh, bursts. I checked, I, actually, I think it's 3,099, but okay, I rounded it up as, uh, as 100. Uh, and it's worth noting that, okay, we exceeded BATSE already in January 2020, so it's been, uh, it's been a long time. And it's, uh, I want to stress that GBM is a very nice instrument for short gamma ray burst uh, detection, because for example, with respect to SWIFT, uh, we detect uh, almost three, four times uh, uh, more than this. In the catalog, you can find all of uh, the, uh, all of these, uh, let's say, uh, distribution, like for example, the uh, duration distribution, which we already saw uh, from the Agile uh, results a few minutes ago. Uh, you see, these are the median values, one second and 29.9 seconds for the long and the short. And it's very interesting that if you look at the intersection, so the intersection is more or less at about 4.2 seconds. And if you divide uh, the long and short at this intersection, you get uh, a higher number of short ones, as a higher percentage of short, short ones up to 22.5%. And if you include also the uncertainties, uh, so if you do a histogram probability density plot uh, incorporating the uncertainties, then you get uh, an even uh, higher percentage, let's say, of, uh, of short bursts. And we go up to 20, 26%. If you are interested, you go please go to the catalog and look at the details. So moving to the spectral catalog that was uh, also published this year. So we have, uh, it's the, the same time period, another 10 years following 
the first and the second spectral catalog. It's a systematic analysis of almost 2,300 gamma ray bursts. And there are two types of spectra, the fluent spectrum, so the time integrated ones, and the peak flux spectrum of the brightest, uh, brightest time beam. They are always uh, uh, fitted with the four, uh, let's say, empirical spectral models, power law, Comptonized band, and smoothly broken power law. You, we have two-sided uncertainties, which is new with respect to the older catalogs. And then you have always this division in a good and best uh, uh, subsamples, so to say, uh, regarding the goodness of the parameters that you get by fitting your, uh, your data. So here, I, there are lots of distribution, lots of plots. I just made a very, very small, let's say, uh, uh, you, you have a, a selection, let's say, of results because there are really, really many results here in this table. For example, you can see the main results for all of the four spectra models for the fluent spectra and for the peak flux spectra. The plots here just show the fluence and for the best category, not the good one. So, I mean, you have all of the other distributions in the paper if you are interested in. It's nice to see what the medium values are of this distribution. You see alpha around minus one, beta around minus 2.2, and E peak. These for, uh, let's say, for, 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 for all of our models. You see here you have the different uh, uh, components that are in color, and then the gray is the full distribution. E peak is around 180, uh, 180 kV. Uh, it's also interesting to see what is the difference between long and short gamma ray bursts to see, uh, and we find again, I mean, something that was found also in the literature, so to say that short bursts have higher median values of EPIC and also show harder low energy power law indexes. Uh, so I, I will flash this uh, very, really fast. And let's move to the higher energies. So let's switch now to the large area telescope. Uh, we published our second GRB catalog in 2019. Here you see the very nice sky map that was produced by the NASA Goddard Media Group, showing all of our detection in green. These are 186 GRBs, uh, 169 long and 17 short, always divided with the two second, the standard two second rule. So uh, it comes after the first catalog, which just had three years of data. So it's a, a much bigger increase. We checked indeed not only GBM triggers, but also triggers coming from SWIFT, from Integral, from Agile, from the IPN in general. Uh, we uh, performed the, the analysis with an improved algorithm with respect to the first uh, to the first. Um, catalog and we got a much higher improvement in the detection rate as is uh, as you can see in this graph here on the top uh, uh, right uh, uh, getting up to a uh, 50 percent improvement with the new algorithm and also using when we switched many years ago now to the past eight uh, data uh, we also gained another 10 percent of improvement uh, and so we uh, arrived to a much higher number of detection okay i wanted just to put the most famous grbs uh, alessandro already mentioned them uh, the most famous long one which also, I mean, all of these bursts happened at the very beginning of the mission of 8916C, which was published uh, in Science, and the, the also the very famous on 90510. Usually, we always, uh, uh, when we publish these nice bursts, we always include the gamma ray burst monitor light curves on the top, uh, so that you can see really how the gamma ray burst evolves uh, in every uh, energy band from the lowest ones to the highest ones. Uh, as I said, so one one was uh, published in science, the other one was published in nature, and then uh, the super famous 1304-278, the so-called monster verse, which was uh, until recently our best, uh, uh, let's say, our best candidate for very high energy detection because it had the famous 95 GV photons and as we know, Veritas was almost there in catching, in catching this burst, unfortunately, because it happened, I mean, it lasted almost 20 hours, the last afterglow. So they were almost on target, uh, and uh, it was really a pity that it could not be seen by, by Veritas at the time. So um, let's go a little bit into the latter results. Uh, we present, again, this is just a very small sub-selection of plots and of results. It's very interesting to study the temporal properties of gamma rebirths at high energies. So 
We did a very detailed study of the onset and of the duration of the high energy emission in the, in the typical LAT band, so from 100 MeV to 100 GeV. Uh, we, see, we see, as we already saw in the first catalog, but here we saw it even more, I mean, that the high energy emission is always systematically delayed and, and it lasts much longer with respect to low energy emission. So I, I put here a, 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 a subsample of plots, uh, let's say, um, highlighting this property. Uh, it's also interesting to note in the very last plot on the bottom uh, right that the high energy emission usually starts before the low energy emission is over. So it's not always that you have the GPM and then uh, the lap comes at some point, but for many bursts uh, we have the uh, high energy emission that is kicking in while the low energy emission is still, is still there for, for many, for really many bursts. Uh, so we compared uh, the properties of the, the LAT burst with uh, the 10 year GBM sample. And what I want to stress is that uh, with respect to the first catalog, we do not only uh, catch, uh, let's say the brightest uh, GBM burst. So once you say, okay, this is a bright burst in GBM, we have to see it with LAT. We also saw the afterglow of very faint GBM uh, bursts. So um, the, also high High energy emission from weak burst is not something, let's say, that we, you can uh, simply rule out. Um, also, uh, regarding the, let's say, the, the, the energetics of uh, lab gamma ray burst, uh, it's interesting to see that if you study the emission, uh, the fluence, so to say, in the energy band of uh, GBM, so 10, uh, 10 kV to 1 MeV in the GBM time window, you see that the fluence at, at low energies is 10 times larger than the fluence at high energies. So most of the burst energy is emitted at low energy in the window of emission of the GBM, let's say in the T90, uh, in the T90 window. While if you move then uh, to the so-called, uh, what we call in the catalog, the X window. So if you move uh, to, um, let's say, uh, the longer time scales, so the time of the extended emission of the LAT, then you see that the fluence measured in this time window is more or less uh, similar, comparable to the one that was emitted during the, the, GBM, uh, the GBM time window. You have many more of these results. I mean, this is just a super short selection of <laughs> of highlights that I wanted to show you here. If you are interested, you have all of the full results in the, in the catalog. The last thing that I wanted to mention is the fact about uh, the highest energy photons. Uh, as I told you, our record holder in, the, in Fermi is uh, still uh, 1304.27a with the 95 GV, but we found also other, uh, other very high energy, well, very high energy for, for lap uh, photons always coming from 1327a, so 77 GV. Then we have all of these uh, photons at around 30 kV that were seen also in the famous the first uh, uh, burst. Um, and so we made uh, several distributions about uh, these, uh, these um, this event, and we did not find uh, a clear path. I mean that the, these high energy photons can arrive often when the low energy emission is over, but it's not always the rule because sometimes they can be also produced very quickly uh, or sometimes super late. So, I mean, this is really a challenge. And I think that Yoni will <clears throat> discuss this in the next talk uh, uh, even, more, uh, even more in detail. So uh, moving to something that you, <laughs> we already discussed largely on Monday, so the, the, the very high energy detections of uh, gamma ray bursts. So the breakthrough came uh, with uh, these uh, very beautiful uh, uh, bursts uh, uh, seen by Hess and by Magic uh, in 2019 and in 2018 and 2019. And I just wanted to stress, uh, let's say, the role of uh, Fermi, of Fermi in particular, Fermi Lab, but also Fermi GBM in the detection of uh, such nice, uh, nice events. Uh, obviously, there is also that we, we already know there is also the other detection that is still not, let's say, published, but there is uh, the, uh, the GCN about, uh, about this event that was seen uh, in, uh, in December last year. So starting in chronological order <laughs> from 1807-20V, so this was a very bright uh, GRB and it was super bright for uh, GBM. It was uh, one of the brightest uh, uh, among all of the GBM bursts ever, ever recorded. It was a very nice and clear Fermilab detection. Actually, this is a burst that is in the catalog. It's one of the last bursts of the LAT, uh, second uh, LAT GRB catalog. Uh, unfortunately, the, photo, the maximum photon energy was only 5 GB, so not spectacular. 
Uh, and even more unfortunately, the GRB was rapidly moving out of the lat field of view. So after 700 seconds, there was, there was, there was no, other, uh, there no other detection of this, uh, of this event. And here you, you probably, I mean, you already saw it uh, on Monday, you have uh, the LAT and the GBM data uh, superposed uh, on the, um, let's say, multi-wavelength light curve of, of this event. And here you see the, the GBM on top in green and the LAT in blue. And unfortunately, the LAT data only lasts until 700 seconds because, because afterwards the, GB, the GRB goes out of the field of view and it never, I mean, it is never seen in the subsequent uh, time windows. Uh, I am almost uh, done, Franz. Uh, just a very few last slides. You already saw this in the talk by Alessandro, uh, 1901-14C. Uh, uh, so I, I won't discuss it even more, the, uh, the whole uh, uh, power law component that is popping out uh, in the GBM plus LAT uh, data analysis I mean, of, of this uh, wonderful uh, GRB. And, uh, um, it was the second most fluent uh, GRB detected by LAT. I mean, it's very small, but maybe here you can see there is a very small star uh, just superimposed on what we published in the catalog just to show you how bright uh, this event was. And again, uh, I think you already largely discussed it on Monday. Uh, you have the multi wavelength light curve with also the LAT and GBM results here. Uh, a last word about the last uh, published GRB, uh, 1908-29, by the HES collaboration. Uh, so it was a long burst. You see, in GBM, it was not particularly bright at high energies. I just put here an example of all of the energy ranges uh, of covered by the GBM. And there was no LAT detection, only upper limits that are also visible here in the multi-wavelength light curve uh, published in the science paper. Uh, Unfortunately, I mean, the, the, LAT, uh, the, sorry, the, the GRB was in the LAT field of view uh, until uh, 1,000 uh, kilosecond, I mean, 1,000 1, seconds at a nice, uh, at a nice uh, theta angle, but it was not, uh, not seen. And I want to stress that uh, the last uh, detection, uh, the, I mean, the 20 by, by magic, uh, again, uh, unfortunately here, the GRB was not in the LAT field of view until 3,000 seconds, and there are just uh, a few uh, upper limits afterwards uh, in, the, in the first uh, time window. So I will go to my conclusions. So since 13 years, the Fermi mission is constantly providing a great data set for GRB science. We have, uh, I mean, a GBM and, and LAT with this uh, number of, of births are the most prolific, prolific GRB instrument in their respective, let's say, energy band. And uh, together with all of the other, I mean, with, with Swift, but they are really, I mean, and also Agile that we heard before, they are really fundamental in order to trigger the multi-wavelength and the multi-messenger follow-up. So not only for gamma ray bursts, but also for, for GV. Uh, obviously, we are very keen on uh, CTA coming up, uh, so we are really now playing together with SM Magic, and we know that with CTA, we've, it will have 10 times better sensitivity than the current instruments. So we really hope that it, this will boost the very high GGRB uh, detection rate in the prompt and in the afternoon. And what we hope is that Fermi will still be there once the CTA will be online. So this is the greatest hope that we have right now. And I will go, I will uh, finish here and thank you for the attention. Thanks, Elisabetta, also for keeping uh, in your time slot. So are there questions to Betta? Otherwise, I have one. OK, don't see any other questions. I will ask you one, one, um, one point, Elisabetta. You mentioned about uh, CTA, so the prospects of the joint uh, detection. So uh, let's say, do you have any, uh, let's say, uh, for, um, forecast for how much the film will be prolonged? So to keep uh, active yeah. while CTA, how as the community we can support in case of this decision? Well, well, uh, I mean, uh, Fermi, as we know, is uh, undergoes a senior review uh, every two or three years. Uh, now I don't remember the next one is coming up soon. So, I mean, if Fermi proves to be, uh, I mean, uh, always so important for, as I said, for uh, as a multi-wavelength player, a trigger for gamma ray bursts and for uh, other interesting transients. Now this year we had the, the famous magnetar giant flare from an extragalactic, uh, uh, I mean, for, from an extragalactic event. And I mean, if uh, the, the Fermi mission proves to be, uh, let's say, vital for uh, in the multi-wavelength and multi-messenger context, then it's uh, 
easy to write this, this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, proposals during the years. And we and I mean, there are no consumables on board Fermi. So until the uh, all instruments perform uh, nicely, and they are, I mean, they are not, uh, apart from the solar panel problem we had a few years ago, there were no other, I mean, the instrument themselves are, are performing greatly, really. So uh, I, I, I assume that uh, we will, uh, hopefully pass this review every uh, thought years uh, and so we will be able to be there at least for a few other years so, i mean we should have already been over somehow <laughs> and we are still there so i, I really let's, let's say I, I really cross fingers that this will continue for the next uh, many years <laughs> to come Okay, should I stop my screen share? I can't hear Franz. Seems like seems yes, like we lost problem. Franz. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's okay, continue. I will, uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Elisabetta. And uh, yeah, let's move on um, while waiting for Franz to to reconnect. Uh, we have a, a look at the at the theory side now. Turn then this this share screen, yes, and go ahead. Sorry. Okay. It was working fine just seconds ago. Uh, yes, but I was on mute and without the camera. So I'll try to share again and then I couldn't do anything about it. Okay. Okay. Well, no. sure. okay. Otherwise, you wouldn't hear me. So can you see uh, that's... now? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk here. I will give a theoretically oriented overview of the uh, high energy emission uh, from gamma ray bursts. And the outline of my talk is as follows. I'll first uh, discuss uh, potentially relevant high energy emission mechanisms. Then I would discuss uh, Trump GRB high energy emission observations versus uh, theory in particular, I would rely on previous talks in this session that gave a very nice overview on uh, some of the most relevant observations. I would discuss the delayed high energy emission onset, the high energy spectral component that was shown already, uh, what we can learn from high energy emission about the Lorentz factor and radius of the emission region in the prompt GRB. And what can we learn from the long-lived high energy emission that can last for very long? Then I would give a case study of high energy afterglow, the case of the very bright uh, GRB 1304-27A that was already discussed partly. So what can we learn from it? And in particular implications on relativistic and legionless shock physics. And at the very end, I would discuss uh, two things that you can learn uh, about from this high energy GRB emission that are non-GRB physics, essentially about the extragalactic background light and Lorentz invariance violation. Okay, so high energy emission uh, processes. So uh, the two uh, most relevant types of uh, emission processes are leptonic and hadronic. In the leptonic processes, you typically can see here uh, that you have, uh, you expect a synchrotron component by relativistic electrons gyrating in magnetic fields within the emitting region. And those same synchrotron photons can be Compton up scattered by the same population of relativistic electrons into higher energies. And then you get the so-called synchrotron self Compton component that peaks at higher photon energies. Now, 
this uh, SSC or synchrotron self-compton versus synchrotron component have some interesting relations directly related to the underlying physics. Essentially, the ratio of their peak uh, nu nu photon energies is the square of the typical Lorentz factor of the emitting electrons, gamma E squared. And the ratio of their luminosity is the famous Compton Y parameter here that you can see is related in a fairly simple manner to both the radiative efficiency epsilon rad and the well-known epsilon in epsilon b, the microphysical parameters, the fractions of the internal energy in the emitting region that go into these accelerated electrons and the magnetic field respectively. Okay, now on the other hand, we have uh, hadronic uh, processes, sorry. Okay, uh, oops. In hadronic uh, processes, uh, we can have, oops, what's happening here? Okay, it's transitioning alone. We can have uh, photo pair production, proton synchrotron, pi and uh, production via P gamma or PP interactions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, hadronic processes are generally inefficient. In particular, uh, for the afterglow, they're even much less efficient. This is because they require high densities, so a small emission radius. You can have that in under certain circumstances for the prompt emission and the afterglow, it's uh, very hard. And uh, finally, we can have uh, photospheric quasi-thermal emission, but that is uh, relevant for low energies under MeV, so not high energies. So I would not uh, discuss this much further in this talk. Now, why is it not switching? Okay. So uh, from observations of uh, high energy emission from actual GRBs, it appears that this Compton Y parameter varies and sometimes even exceeds unity. So sometimes you can have more energy in the high energy component. Usually you have somewhat less during the prompt emission. And in particular, in the famous uh, GRB 080916C, we have a single dominant emission uh, component up to the highest observed energies, which means you should hide the SSE component. So either the Compton Y parameter is below about 0.1 or it peaks at uh, very high energies, TV energies. So above uh, what LAT could see, but uh, still very interesting for uh, TV instruments. And finally, if you take the observational constraints and these two components, you can really constrain uh, the relevant physical parameters, in particular, the ratio of epsilon E and epsilon B, the bulk Lorentz factor, the typical Lorentz factor of the emitting electrons and emitting radius. And you can have a mission that's limited in the highest energy by uh, Klein-Nishina effects, but it can reach TV energies potentially, which is very interesting for uh, CTA and other instruments. So uh, here you see uh, two uh, well-known uh, bright and uh, Fermi lat emission GRBs, uh, long GRB 080916C and GRB 090510 that, uh, that I showed before. Uh, they both show delayed emission. And what I want to show you here is that uh, essentially what this delayed emission means is that you miss the first spike, as you can see here in this long GRB, causing a delay of four or five seconds. And in this short GRB, you miss the first few spikes, but then later spikes really coincide in all energies. So this so-called delayed emission is truly missing the first spike or a few spikes at high energies. So, uh, we can see here that also in uh, most of the brightest uh, GRBs at high energies, you see this distinct high energy spectral component showing as a power law, which is usually fairly hard. And the fact that it's uh, very common in the brightest burst suggests that it's intrinsically very common and you just need the good photon statistics to detect it uh, with high significance. And in addition to that, we see some time resolved uh, spectra here. It tends to uh, become harder throughout the duration of uh, the GRB, which might partly explain why at early times when it's less hard, you 
miss the first spikes at the high energies. So can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, it was too quiet. Thanks. Okay, so what can we learn from the theoretical perspective? So uh, first of all, uh, if we consider leptonic processes uh, in Verse Compton or SSE for the high energy component, then the gradual increase in the high energy photon index beta, which in this case would be determined by the electron energy distribution power law index, uh, it's not naturally expected uh, to, to become harder throughout the duration of the burst. It's possible, but it's not very natural. Uh, it's hard to account for the different photon indexes on the one uh, hand here in the high energy component, on the other, other hand, the low energy component of the band because they're expected to be the same in this synchrotron SSC combined uh, model. And finally, it's hard to produce the extension of this power law component to low energies uh, below the band component, which is seen in many cases. So that's kind of a drawback of uh, that. And for hadronic uh, modules, you could have a pair cascades, proton synchrotron, et cetera. Again, you don't naturally expect a gradual increase in beta, though it's possible. Uh, one drawback is that in many cases, energy requirements are fairly extreme. It could be two to three orders of magnitude above what you see in gamma rays. And what you see in gamma rays is already pretty demanding energetically. So you need huge amounts of energy. On the other hand, you do naturally produce an extension of the power law component at the low energies from synchrotron emission from secondary pairs that are produced in such uh, scenarios. So each of these interpretations has some pros and cons. Now we can learn about the bulk Lorentz factor of the emitting region from seeing such a high energy spectral component, in particular, if there is no cutoff in this power law, one can put a lower limit on the bulk Lorentz factor, gamma min. And this is from compactness arguments, uh, opacity to uh, gamma gamma pair production within the source. The limits uh, put by uh, Fermi lat are more uh, robust than previous ones because they do not assume uh, the existence of photons above the highest energy photon that is actually observed compared to previous uh, limits of that kind. Uh, one caveat is that tau gamma gamma within the source depends both on the bulk Lorentz factor gamma and the emission radius uh, r. And in order to get this gamma mean, you need to assume some relation between r and gamma. The usual assumed relation that you see here holds in many models, but not all of them. So that's one slight caveat. Now for the brightest uh, lat GRBs, both long and short, you get the gamma min order of uh, 1000 for a simple model assuming steady state uniform isotropic photon field within the source. However, if you do a more uh, careful analysis, you get about the factor of two uh, lower gamma min order 500. That's our more realistic time dependent self consistent uh, thin shell uh, model. Now, in cases where you actually see a cutoff, you can estimate the Lorentz factor itself. And for these two types of models, in this case, GRB 909-26A, you get uh, an estimate of 700 or 300 respectively. The 300 is probably the more realistic uh, number. Okay, now for the long lived component, as was shown very nicely by Beta, you see in many GRBs uh, that the GV emission lasts well uh, after the MEV emission. It typically decays as a power line time, T to the minus one to 1 1.5 roughly, whereas the spectrum is a power law, flattish nu of nu, beta close to uh, minus two. And well above the T90 of the MEV emission, it's almost certainly afterglow emission, but when you see sharp spikes initially, it's part of the prompt emission. You can't get such high temporal variability from the afterglow emission. Uh, there are other possible explanations, et cetera. And sometimes you might even see the transition. Probably it was seen, uh, the, one of the best cases is GRB 1901-14C that was uh, discussed extensively. There are other possible explanations. Maybe it's associated with excite flares, maybe hadronic processes, pair echoes, SSC, et cetera, et cetera. In most cases, this does not seem to be the case. In some cases, especially at very high energies, it could be SSC, but that was already discussed quite uh, extensively. 
Okay, now I'll switch to high energy afterglow from GRB 130427A, monster burst. It was discussed extensively. So I'll just briefly remind you that it was detected up to about 20 hours after the GRB and GV energies with uh, many high energy photons above 10 GV up to hours after the GRB. Uh, it may partly arise due to prompt emission in the first few hundred seconds, but at much longer uh, times, you see just a very smooth parallel decay, parallel spectrum, everything tells us it has to be afterglow at late times. And here you see again uh, from optical through X-rays to gamma rays, you can see the nice parallel behavior. So at late times, it's clearly afterglow. And if you look here, at the spectrum in particular, uh, you know, lasting from uh, optical through uh, X-rays all the way to uh, GV, it's consistent, uh, consistent with a single synchrotron spectral component. And in particular, the upper limit by Veritas uh, leaves very little room for any SSC component appearing at the highest energies. So it appears to be uh, dominated by a single synchrotron component in this case. And why is this so interesting? Because it clearly violates the famous uh, maximum synchrotron uh, photon energy limit. Now this limit, so-called burn-off uh, limit, is based on a one zone model balancing electron energy gains and losses, equating acceleration time to synchrotron energy last time. And you can see the two lines here where even the lower lines are very conservative. They assume the electron essentially doubles its energy on a single Larmor gyration time, which is extremely optimistic. It's probably accelerating slower than that. The upper lines are crazily optimistic, assuming it doubles its energy doing only one radian out of this Larmor gyration, which is unphysical in my view, but still, you know, it clearly violates this limit by about an order of magnitude. Now, what does it mean? An easy way out would have been if it was dominated by SSC, but it doesn't seem to work in this particular case. It might work in other cases. So there really appears to be a true violation of uh, this limit here, which means at least one of our assumptions must, must break. Now, what might break? The best candidate is the assumption of a uniform magnetic field in the acceleration and emission region. So you could in principle have just behind the shock that accelerates the particle, a high magnetic field region and well downstream of the shock, the magnetic field could decay and become lower in which case the bulk of the acceleration would be in a lower magnetic field B2 and the highest energy photons may be emitted when these high energy electrons reach the higher magnetic field region B1 and emit these photons, in which case you can exceed this limit by the ratio of these two magnetic fields. In this case, it has to be about an order of magnitude, seems to be potentially plausible. Now, uh, we can use high energy emission from GRBs to also constrain other physics, not only intrinsic physics of GRBs. One example is constraining uh, the extragalactic background light because the gamma rays from the source and the GRB on the way to us can interact with this uh, EBL radiation field and produce electron positron pairs. Now this can test the transparency of the universe and EBL models, essentially a massive star formation with cosmological redshifts. Uh, GRBs are competitive with AGN and probe higher redshifts. And in particular using blazars, it was probably already detected. So GRBs are interesting in that respect. And finally, they can test Lorentz invariance violation, where the idea here is that GRBs are thought of as a short pulse of radiation at cosmological distance. So they emit uh, high energy photons of various energies. And if you had an even very slight difference in the propagation speed of photons as a function of their energy, some vacuum dispersion so-called, then they would reach us at different times, even if they were emitted at exactly the same time and place in the source. Now, the best way to test this, the best source so far was a short GRB 090510. It is much better than all the rest simply because it was short. So it's a very short pulse. It was very hard spectrum and had very fine uh, time structure with uh, spikes lasting, you know, five or 10 milliseconds. 
So it was extremely useful and we used it in uh, 2009 in the Nature paper to set uh, the first direct time of flight limit and linear Lorentz invariance uh, violation or vacuum energy dispersion that is above the Planck scale or Planck energy. It is robust, conservative, using two independent methods. So that really uh, made a lot of noise. This was improved four years later using three different methods. Uh, well, we use four GRBs, but still by far this one short GRB gave the, the most uh, strict limits. So we were able to improve the limits by a factor of a few. And finally, in 2015, we put the first Planck scale limit on uh, stochastic uh, LIV motivated by space-time foam uh, models. Again, uh, this is the first limit of its type above the Planck scale, which is the only natural scale in this problem. So two minutes, Yoni. Okay, oh, perfect in time. <laughs> I was just giving you two minutes. Perfect, Yoni. So, so sorry for the problem in the beginning of your talk. So are there a question to Yoni? Okay, Christoph, please. Hello. Um, so when you talk about the burn-off limits, uh, the synchrotron limit for photon energy, uh, you mentioned uh, field, uh, magnetic field compression by shock as a possibility, but uh, other possibility that has been discussed in other contexts was uh, magnetic reconnection, which, uh, which allows to have E greater than B uh, and and uh, accelerate particles uh, beyond the limit. Is that uh, possible in uh, in this context or or not? Well, in principle, you know, it's a nice idea, but the question is, how well can this uh, work in practice? So, in I, I guess the question is the sigma. If 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 it can be high. Well, let's put it this way. It could work in potentially in the prompt emission. Since we're talking in this particular case about you know hours after the GRB and it's clearly afterglow, the answer is no, it can't work in the afterglow. Because in the afterglow, you're talking about the collision and shock going into the external medium. You expect there, you know, to, to have the upstream sigma negligibly small, you know, order of 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus 10. And uh, it's hard to see how you can have acceleration by magnetic reconnection in the afterglow. So it's potentially relevant for prompt GRB emission. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. So I see another question by Hendrik, please. While you have that slide up on the magnetic field, so I was just wondering, does this require anything peculiar? For that to work, the B2, B1 ratio, or is this sort of a general recipe that provides a way out? Is this easy to uh, achieve in practice or does it require tuning of some form? Well, uh, there is still a lot of room for more quantitative uh, study of this. So it has been put out, you know, um, as a toy model basically so far. So if you have such a configuration, it's possible, but how to get it in practice, it's less clear. So you expect, uh, you know, in the afterglow to have some initial amplification or generation of magnetic field just behind the shock, but then you expect it probably to decay over a certain scale, you know, maybe hundreds to thousands of plasma skin depth beyond the shock, and then it could potentially saturate. It ne needs to saturate and not completely decay in order to explain uh, afterglow observations. But then again, this layer would be fairly thin. So even, you know, a thousand or 10 to the four plasma skin depth compared to the whole uh, afterglow emitting region, it's a small fraction. So to have enough photons emitted there, it's not, not clear how well you can explain it uh, quantitatively, even if qualitatively it might work. So that's a caveat and still uh, needs to be explored in my mind. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Yoni, and uh, all the other that uh, let's say participated to the discussion of this uh, very first uh, talk. 
So on the theory talk, I mean, and uh, let's move now to the uh, fourth uh, contribution of the session, which is by Yerlan Ayumarotov. So please, Yerlan, it is your turn. Hello, do you hear me well? Yes, yes. Okay, let me share my screen first. Do you see my screen correctly? Yes, sir. yes. Is, is it moving correctly? It is moving correctly. Please go ahead, Yerlan. Okay. So hello and thank you for <clears throat> inviting me to join this conference. Today I will talk about the gamma ray burst with high energy photons and associated with the supernovae. This is a, a talk which is based on a very fresh new and maybe raw results still, but um, it's, it was to be mentioned and maybe we can discuss after all the details of further steps. Okay, today I will talk about uh, the main part. I will revise the main part of the uh, GRB Supernova Association and the GRB Jeff Photons Association. Then I will uh, move to the methods and the results and discussion, the small discussion I have. So as you already know that uh, GRB uh, exhibits his behavior in all the electromagnetic spectrum, not only all, but also the gravitational waves. And we hope to be a neutrino to come soon. And uh, the first part to be mentioned is also, uh, is the phenomenology of the long short duration. It is not more the phenomenology because as you might heard also the, the progenitus is hinted by the duration itself. But, the, but the very, in the very beginning, it was a really a phenomenology. So people were observing GRB duration and uh, they, they had seen that there was some behavior uh, dividing and, and, and showing the B model distribution. The first uh, heart and the, uh, the, the first heart proof for that was done by uh, work in nine, 1993 by uh, Coviliato. Uh, which was then stood as the um, true, and then people started to look at this uh, phenomenology from the from the other side, and starting to to search and uh, to look for the theoretical models as well. <clears throat> Further, uh, uh, by the way, this was done by the by the Batsi telescope uh, dedicated to the GRB study. Further missions like Fermi, <clears throat> GBM and the swift bot missions also were observing the T90 distribution and also confirmed the B model distribution. So also the hardness ratio shows that the emission from the GRB comes <coughs> in two parts, showing the distinct relation for that. So here's the recent results by paper 2016 and here the Fermi results showing that the distribution of the GRB is by the way, cosmological and comes from the outer, outer universe. So another, uh, another part, which I would like to talk today is the high energy emissions of the GeV photons from the gamma ray burst, which was, which was discussed also today by uh, previous speakers. And uh, here we analyze the, here we show the, the statistics and uh, for the, for the, for the time of uh, release of the second catalog by Fermilat, it was around 169 LET detections uh, by the GRBs. And what is the high energy photons? They are shown in the blue dots here, and it shows that there's like a emissions count-like experiment of photons coming from the GRB part. Uh, which has a random distribution actually, and does not strongly correlate with the prompt emission in the MeV keV part as well. And th then it was uh, named afterglow, which uh, because it happens for a long extended time after the burst itself. So, and they are different in behavior and duration as well. And they're present in the short GRBs and the long GRBs here I show the most prominent, uh, the most prominent uh, iconic uh, GRBs 
from the short one and from the long distribution one. Another part is the phenomenology of uh, supernova association. By the time of the first redshift discovery, the first uh, supernova association was found and uh, it was, it, it is still be found by photometric and uh, spectral observations. And the photometric observations here, usually in the GRB, here's the X-ray afterglow and here's the optical afterglow, for example. Uh, the optical afterglow has the simple power law um, behavior during the time. And when we see the, when we associate the supernova with the GRB, we say that there is like a bump behavior. Uh, by the way, this bump uh, I checked is not about the supernova as, as well this one. So the, the bump is shown like here, it's a fast rebrightening in the, in the magnitude, like within days, it usually happens at 10 days. So the, the first 10 days, depending on the, depending on the evolution of the burst. And the increase uh, could rise even like three, four magnitudes. And the bump behavior present in all uh, GRB associated with the supernova photometrically. But as well, we have uh, spectroscopic uh, evidence for the association with the supernova. So when the big telescopes look at the position of the GRB after and follow up for several days, even, even months like here, they see that the emission, the spectrum, uh, evolves towards the broadening of the, uh, of the absorption lines. And it shows, here is the prominent lines uh, by which it is identified as a supernova and uh, evolves drastically. So the supernova itself. Here is the collection of the uh, several supernovae associated with the GRB. And uh, you can see that the spectral behavior is um, somehow random, to be honest. This is the iconic uh, 1998 DW, the first one of its kind, uh, GRB associated with the supernova. And uh, it's like a standard ruler to be measured with the new candidates. And, <clears throat> and uh, looking at the energetics of the GRB associated with the supernovae, one can say that there is not so much uh, behavior showing that they are located um, like uh, separately from the rest of the long GRBs. By the way, they associate it with the long GRBs because uh, there is enough time to detect probably. And uh, I mean, observe from the observational point of view. And here in the color, color, color dots, you can see the the, the population of the GRB supernovae. And you can see as well that the energetics of the prompt emission of, this, of the GRB spans from like uh, 10 to the 54 to the 10 to the 40, 10, even, even 10 to the 40, 48 ERC in energies and the peak energy in the spectrum on, of the prompt emission also scatters like three, three orders of magnitude. So, by having the, the, the first reliable and like uh, quite enough number of uh, GRB supernovae, there were, um, there were, uh, there were attempts to, to classify them. And mostly they are classified, as you can see, by the um, luminosity. So the, the, the brighter they are, they are collected in one sample, in one group, and the, the dimmer they are, they are collected in another group. Another, another category is to look for the duration. So it's like ultra long duration GRB supernovae. Uh, so they are responsible, they are, they are responsible for the different mechanism of emitting also. So, so we now want to focus on both the collection of the GRB with the Jeff photons and GRBs with the supernovae. So it's like a kind of an intersection of these two groups. And the reason you can expect that the, the, this sample is very small. 
and indeed is very small. But uh, let's try to look at them and uh, maybe we can see something interesting for us. So <clears throat> the method is very simple. Just to in, just we just intersect two populations, and uh, of course we, due to the possibility of GF detection only by Fermi, we focus on the era of Fermi lat operation. Uh, to the moment, to, to this year, there are more than two hundred or so GRBs with the high energy photons, both with and without that shift, and there are around ninety uh, fifty nine uh, GRB supernovae. Uh, half of them happened before Fermi era, so we just throw them up. And uh, we just look for the and cross correlate the information from different catalogs of the Fermi, of the GCN circulars, and the big table by the Dr. Greiner, uh, Dr. Coppin, and also research for the information of the supernova because there are many transients happening and the supernova. Uh, are obtained like uh, in a usual way now, not like uh, 10 years ago. <clears throat> so uh, it is reflected also in the naming of this supernova we can see later. And by collecting this information, uh, we have only five GRB, GF GRB supernova population to the time. We have 25 more candidates for that, and we are checking now them. <clears throat> and you can see that the from the first glance, if you cover the GV part, you can see that the GRB supernova um, properties for the redshift are more or less standard, usual. They're having less than redshift two, it's uh, obvious. And uh, their behavior, their behavior is uh, also standardized to the uh, supernova 1998 PW. So, in the energetics, they are different. I can show it later. And uh, all of them have the GEV present. This is puzzling because GEV photons is believed to happen in the energetic GRBs. And as we know, the supernova happens in GRBs, which is less energetic. So this could puzzle a bit, but uh, it tends to be <clears throat> it tends to be true that uh, GRB Jeff GRB supernovae is uh, less energetic in, uh, in most, but it, this is not the, the, the ultimate case. So there are 25 more candidates to be checked and one of them I will discuss later. This is actually uh, 2008, 2068. Actually the reason I have studied this population in detail, like you know, three, three weeks ago, months ago, I started this work. So the, 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 the results are very preliminary. So, uh, as I told, uh, you can see the bump in the light curve, or you can spectroscopically identify the, the supernova after all. So <clears throat> they are identified, and for the, for the rest of the GRBs, you can see here without GEV, it needs to be checked like for the upper limit also. We are, we are, we are still doing this work. Yeah, in a few minutes. So, okay. Few minutes. okay. okay. So as I told, there is like a five uh, population, uh, five uh, objects of the population, 25 candidates to be checked and 29, unfortunately we cannot check because it happened pre-Fermi era. So let's move on. What is interesting in, the, in our population? So as in, as in previous result, this GRB 1304.27 and this GRB 1307.02 are JEV GRB supernova. Right? Uh, residents. So you can see that the energy spans, and the tropic energy spans a lot. This is, a, by the way, the EPKI is a, a matter relation for the, for the spectral harvest also. Another two, another three candidates happening also showing the diverse behavior on this plot. For example, 171205 is uh, 2 to the 24 Earth is up to here, this dot, this dot here. So uh, the, the, the peak energy is less than 100. And another two is uh, 10 to the 51. So is around here up. And 10 to the 50, and also around, around here up. So you can see that the energetics is diverse. 
but it, but it could hint us that uh, uh, maybe maybe also the 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 GRB with the supernova lacking the GEV emission can also emit emit so they span across all the uh, GRB supernova population so it can hint us that it could also emit we, we lack due to uh, the the line of sight properties or due to the sensitivity of Fermi Lat, which is discussed many times in the papers. So <clears throat> at the first glance, there is nothing to compare because uh, nothing distinct happens in these populations. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the turning point, the cornerstone for this is a candidate, which we are still analyzing of the, is the 2008-26A, the, uh, the GRB associated with the supernova. Fortunately, the, the bore site of the Fermi lot is 2073, so we can calculate the upper limit for that later. And uh, this GRB is something new because its duration, uh, the, this is the GRB associated with the supernova and, and it's, uh, and it's uh, like uh, the mechanism for that is like a collapser is discussed in this paper. <clears throat> it's a very fresh paper of like two months ago published, but it's a short gamma ray burst. And for, uh, surprisingly, it's T90 duration is 0 0.65 seconds. And uh, the location on the EPIC T90 diagram is around here, but probability of the analysis shows that it most likely uh, to happen in, in, uh, to belong for the long population of burst. But nevertheless, uh, the Elon, you're most gamma, over, eh? okay. gamma, ray, ga gamma ray duration is 0 0.65 seconds only. And uh, you can see and compare with the previous EPK ISO. So it happens as well in, within the amati relation, with the good correlation. So does it mean, <clears throat> does it mean that uh, uh, JFGRB population was to be mentioning on, the, on this meeting? Definitely yes, because you can see it is puzzling by energetics because it spans for five orders of magnitude in, on the ISA. And there is as well short duration uh, prompt emission, which also occurs to be a collapser in the end by identified by, by panchromatic behavior of the collapser origin. And um, as well, it happens at close redshifts, at close distances. So we can study them in more detail and maybe in the future we can prove or show that more GRBs with the supernovae or more GRB with the high energy emission can uh, be unified and show both behavior, maybe with the instruments with more sensitivity as well. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm sir. ready for your questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Yerlan, for uh, also the nice uh, talk and uh, the nice topic that you raised. So there is time for one question only, unfortunately. So is there someone that uh, who wants to ask uh, something to Yerlan? Otherwise, I have one small. OK, Yoni, please. Uh, what is so special about this event if it appears to be you know, on the borderline between long and short GRBs? So it naturally is intrinsically of the long hard class of GRBs and therefore shows a supernova. What's so special about it that it made it to nature astronomy? Yeah, in, sorry. Yes, indeed, it goes to the nature astronomy under the revision, but uh, it's surprisingly short. It's 0 0.65 for my, from my experience, uh, this borderline uh, short, long, actually long duration GRBs happens close to the to the two seconds. And in most cases, I have seen that uh, short GRBs happening crossing the border of the long population. But <clears throat> it could hint us that uh, maybe the behavior uh, which we see to the prompt emission and we identify them as uh, long and short with and without supernova or with or without GEV photons could actually be hidden due to the circumburst area or the, the geometry of the burst. So yeah, what I wanted to say that maybe they all show the presence of GEV emission as well. If they are, <clears throat> and, and the, 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 the energetics is not a matter for that. As you can see there are, 
uh, the span of energy in, in four, five orders of magnitude. Okay, see another raise uh, hand by Bim Bim, please uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, uh, this is actually a comment on the GRB 2026A uh, for the question uh, uh, from uh, uh, Jonathan. So basically, uh, if we look at the paper, we have another paper, uh, uh, this, this like a co submitted to astron nature astronomy. The point is that this burst is definitely a short GRB uh, in terms of the duration. It's very sharp spike. You cannot claim there's a tip of iceberg uh, GRB, uh, which has shown before. We have a short GRB uh, associated with a uh, supernova, but you can claim that's a tip of iceberg. Uh, intrinsically, it is long, but this one, it definitely shot. So Duration-wise, it is definitely consistent with being long. You can see here that it's exactly on the borderline between long and short GRBs, and there are long GRBs that show very sharp spikes as well. Uh, if you really look at the light curve, this is actually the most uh, spiky one among all the uh, short GRBs. So that's the key point. Uh, we didn't see the light curve here, but you look at the light curve, uh, you actually can, uh, can get this point. Yeah, that's just my comments. Thank you. Okay, sorry for interrupting because we need to go ahead, but this, uh, let's say, topic is very interesting. So if you wanted, as I said last time, if you wanted, we can create a breakout room. So any of you who want to discuss privately about, uh, let's say, continuing to discuss as it was in a real Congress in, during the coffee break, you can do that. And uh, let me or Fabian do to create a breakout room for you. So now let's uh, thanks uh, again, uh, Yerlan, for the nice and stimulating talk. And then let's move to Thank the you. second uh, theory talk for today. And we have heard about uh, the, let's say, the interpretation of the GV part, uh, mostly. Now we will ask, we have asked uh, Jelica Bosniak to discuss about the prompt emission, especially for in the view of the possible future detection of such component in the very high energy part. So, Jelica, it is your turn, please, if you want to start sharing your screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, and we can hear you very well. And uh, while you start sharing, I'll remind every of you, if you want to share your uh, slides on the Indigo, please do so, so that we can have access to them also later on, if you want. Okay, so please, Jelica, go ahead. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present my work. This is the outline of my talk. I will briefly present some observations at um, high energies. Then I will discuss radiative models for prompt emission. And finally, I will present the multivalent radiation models for low luminosity gamma ray bursts in framework of the internal shock model. So radiation at high energy is expected, for example, from electrons accelerated by internal and external shocks via Fermi mechanism to a parallel uh, energy distribution leading to electron synchrotron radiation, which in the observer frame extends beyond 100 MeV. Inverse quantum scatterings of such synchrotron photons leads to uh, GeV to TeV spectral components. While the emission can extend to TV energies, such photons are likely to be degraded to lower energies by pair production, either in the source itself or in the intervening intergalactic medium, unless the GRB is at very low redshifts. Photons of GV and TV energies were observed with the Fermi, Magic, and Hess experiments. The magic collaboration detected photons in the TEV range from GRB 19.0114C, um, and the multivalent observations of, um, obtained by the magic collaboration have firmly established for the first time the existence of the SSC component in a GRB afterglow. Hess collaboration reported recently the detection of very high energy gamma rays from the afterglow of GRB 190829A. Synchrotron component describing the spectrum of this event would need to extend more than three orders of magnitude beyond the synchrotron limiting energy. This would require an unknown, unknown high efficiency process to accelerate electrons. 
An example of GRB observed by Fermi Latte instrument is the long GRB 170405A. It showed gamma ray emission about 20 MeV delayed for 20 seconds with respect to the emission below 1 MeV, after which temporarily extended emission lasting for about 1,000 seconds in the GeV band was detected. In addition, 200 seconds after the prompt emission started, an op optical onset was observed by SWIFT. So the multi-wavelength observations reveal different temporal onsets in the optical and GV bands at 200 seconds and 20 seconds. And the author suggested that the GV and optical emissions may have different physical origins. A plausible scenario could be synchrotron emission from an internal shock, which can naturally explain the temporal variability in the GV band. The delayed onset can be interpreted as strong um, temporal dependence of the pair production capacity, uh, which can also be longer than the variability time scale. So these are, uh, this was considered in the paper by Pasquet et al. in 2012. The preference of an internal shock scenario over other models was suggested also by Maxim et al. in 2011 to explain the observed behaviors in the GE band for other LAT GRBs. Gamma bursts uh, non-thermal spectrum has led to the suggestion that both the prompt and the afterglow are produced by synchrotron emission of relativistic electrons. There is a reasonable agreement between the prediction of the synchrotron model and afterglow observations. However, the observed spectral shape of the prompt emission is in disagreement with the synchrotron predictions. Recently, Oganesi and et al. have analyzed a sample of few tens of GRBs and performed joint spectral analysis of prompt radiation using a large energy coverage. The inclusion of soft X-ray data revealed a hardening of the spectral shape towards low energies, uh, a break, and then additional parallel segments were added to the uh, fitting function. So the average values of the uh, uh, photon uh, indices uh, below and above the break energy were found to be very close to the expectations from synchrotron radiation in a scenario where the break energy corresponds to cooling break. From the theoretical point of view, we have shown that inverse Compton scatterings in klein Schinner regime affect the spectral shape of the synchrotron component due to a better efficiency for low frequency photons. This resulted in a steepening of the low energy photon index alpha and it was approaching, we found that it can approach to minus, uh, minus one. We also identified a regime of marginally fast cooling synchrotron radiation, where gamma C is very close to gamma M, which leads to even steeper slopes, so to closer to minus two thirds. I'm showing here the two parameters that um, define this effect. One is the WN, which tells us how deep in klein in a regime the scatterings occur. And the other is Y factor that tells us about the importance of inverse Compton versus synchrotron component. So here I'm showing the spectrum, uh, how it changes for a value of um, WM is 100 and for different values of Y. Here I'm showing the uh, spectra in the co-moving frame. Uh, radiative code included synchrotron emission, inverse Compton scatterings, photon-photon annihilation, synchrotron self-absorption and adiabatic cooling. There are four um, parameters that there are four parameters that shape the spectrum. So the minimum electron Lorentz factor um, of electron um, distribution, magnetic field, adiabatic cooling time scale, and density of accelerated electrons. So each panel here shows the evolution of the spectrum when one parameter is varied, while all other parameters are maintained constant. So a strong inverse Compton component is obtained when relativistic electrons like survive long enough for scatterings to occur. So it means that radiative time scale is approaching to expansion time scale and the uh, efficient inverse Compton scatterings to occur for low values of gamma min, low magnetic fields and low Tx. Low density Ne does not favor um, inverse Compton emission uh, but the large uh, densities would, uh, would increase photon density and then also photon-photon annihilation. Inverse Compton component is then strongest for intermediate values of Ne. 
I would like also to mention a very interesting work by Beloborodov and collaborators because the observed prompt MEV radiation is taken as input of the simulations. So the mechanism is the following one. The prompt MEV radiation propagates in the external medium ahead of the blast wave and the external medium becomes paraloaded. The blast wave has a high Lorentz factor and hits the paraloaded external medium. The medium is cooled behind the shock via inverse Compton and synchrotron emission. And when the prompt GRB radiation decouples from the blast wave, the shock heated plasma is also cooled via the slower SSC emission. So the SSC regime occurs in the far tail of the GEV flash. So this plot here shows uh, model light curves and data for short GRB 090510. And this plot shows um, the spectrum of 080916C in three time windows. The curves show inverse, the inverse Compton emission from the blast wave. The prediction of bright emission about 100 GVs can be tested with ground based telescopes like CTA. In the internal shock scenario, initial inhomogeneities in the distribution of Lorentz factors lead to the formation of shock waves that propagate within the relativistic outflow. The shock waves dissipate kinetic energy and accelerate the population of relativistic electrons, which in turn emit synchrotron photons. The acceleration of particles in the internal shocks is accompanied by time-dependent radiative processes which are coupled to each other and in order to follow the evolution of the emergent spectrum, we combine the model for the dynamics of the internal shocks within a relativistic flow with a detailed calculation of the radiative processes occurring in the shocked medium. So for each collision, the physical conditions in the shocked medium are computed. And I'm showing here the Lorentz factor of the shocked region, um, minimum um, Lorentz factor of the electron distribution and the magnetic field. We have developed a code to uh, compute the emission from the shock material. The calculation is done for all the collisions occurring uh, during the dynamical evolution of the relativistic outflow. The calculation of the emission is done in the co-moving frame and the code follows the time evolution of electron density and the photon density, uh, including the processes that um, are shown here. Uh, here I'm showing the time integrated spectra from KV to GV range that are resulting from the simulations. The inverse Compton component is negligible in case A, while it creates a well-defined additional component at high energy in case B. Um, we examine different assumptions on microphysics. So zeta here is the fraction of relativistic electrons that are accelerated to relativistic velocities and on dynamics such as the uh, um, initial Lorentz factor shape or the case where the uh, ejected uh, mass flux is constant. It is interesting to note here um, that the additional component in the GV range is very flat in the new F new spectrum and would probably be fitted by a parallel with the photon index close to minus two as observed in several lat GRBs. These are the light curves in the soft gamma ray range and in the high energy gamma ray range plotted for different cases I've shown in the previous slide. The assumption for the dynamics have a strong impact on the high energy emission. The case where the initial distribution of the Lorentz factor has a sharp transition from minimum to maximum Lorentz factor is particularly interesting. Here, the shocks are immediately violent so the, that the inverse content emission is suppressed by klein ishina corrections. It is only at late times that um, inverse quantum uh, emission becomes bright when more scatterings occur in Thomson regime. We studied also um, the prompt phase of low luminosity gamma ray bursts as potential source of uh, very high energy gamma rays. So this paper is just about to be submitted. Uh, so low luminosity gamma ray burst exhibits substantially lower luminosities and in some cases longer durations than commonly observed gamma ray bursts. Additionally, these events are characterized by relatively low Lorentz factor and lower peak energies. Due to their low luminosity, they are mostly detected at low redshift. So only a small number of low luminosity GRBs have been observed to date. Uh, due to the limited sensitivity of currently running X-ray instruments to low E-peak events. Um, 
The observations by instruments with the ability to detect very faint GRBs showed that the population of low luminosity GRBs may be distinct from high luminosity events and thus dominate uh, the local GRB population. We modeled the spectral energy distribution of three representative examples with observed properties similar to GRBs 9802425, 10.03.16D, and 12.07.14B. Uh, we model them um, in a leptonic SEC scenario using the internal shock model for the relativistic outflow. And we refer to these examples as GRB um, single peak, uh, GRB uh, ultra long, and GRB high luminosity. Um, the last GRB has a higher luminosity when comparing to other GRBs. To investigate the conditions under which inverse content radiation may lead to potentially observable peak in the GeV and TeV range, we vary the fraction of the energy budget supplying for the magnetic field. Um, for comparable sub-MEV emission um, and similar jet properties, the multi-wavelength predictions show a strong dependence on the magnetic field. Weak magnetic fields induce high fluxes in the very high energy regime and low fluxes in the optical and the opposite. However, very high energy emission might be suppressed by photon-photon uh, absorption uh, or uh, interactions with the inter extragalactic background light uh, for redshifts larger than 0.1. Here I'm showing the flux and fluence as a function of observation duration for different choices uh, of epsilon b. Also, the predicted observed spectra is uh, shown for high luminosity gamma ray bursts placed at uh, different redshifts. Dotted lines represent the uh, um, spectra with EBL uh, absorption, and the red markers show the minimal fluence nominally detectable by CTA for an observation duration of 150 seconds. These plots show the light curves for different high energy regimes for these three cases. We show the results for different choices of epsilon b. It is interesting to notice that high energy emission shows a delayed onset with increasing epsilon b in all scenarios. This is an example how the different observed light curves may be used to constrain the physical process. So the early signal in a single peak light curve is related to collisions close to the source. And these are subject to strong photon-photon uh, absorption, which potentially suppresses the high energy component. This is the last uh, subject I would like to address. So the photon-photon interactions between primary gamma rays from the gamma ray burst and low, um, and, um, low energy- I, Five minutes, Jelica, to the end. Thank you. And so the uh, photon photon interactions between primary gamma rays from the GRB and low energy photons of the EBL generate electron positron pairs far away from the source. The pairs can be deflected by weak intergalactic magnetic fields for a short period before giving rise to secondary GV and TV components by upscattering ambient CMB photons. They would arrive with a characteristic time delay relative to the primary emission that depends on the properties of the intergalactic magnetic fields. We have calculated the contribution to the extragalactic diffuse gamma ray background from low luminosity gamma ray bursts. We show in this figure the expected contribution from a population of low luminosity GRBs if all of them were described by a prototype we called ultra long gamma ray burst. And we compare, we compare it with the um, extragalactic gamma ray background measured by Fermi. Uh, note that um, extragalactic gamma ray background is expected to be driven by active galactic nuclei, and the expected contribution from other source classes is small. So we show here in the dotted purple curve uh, the 14% of the uh, extragalactic gamma ray background flux since blazers already provide 86% of contribution. We show this as the possible maximal contribution from low luminosity GRBs to uh, the extragalactic gamma ray background. Um, we are showing here, um, so the cases for two choices of magnetic field, and also uh, just to show how much this low luminosity GRBs uh, contribute, 
um, to non-blazer contribution, we multiply this uh, two distributions for, by factor 125. And this is my summary. Um, so thank you. And I'm ready to answer any question, questions if there are any. Okay, thanks, Jelica. So I see already one question by Yoni, please. And then one by Giovanni. Uh, hi. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, you mentioned that you can get the delayed onset of the high energy emission. My question is, is this a matter of tuning the parameters and could you get for a different choice of parameters the opposite trend? Do you really get it naturally? Well, well there are two effects. First, uh, we are following the evolution of the relativistic jet. Um, so since we have the evolution of the microphysics parameters, uh, you would um, expect also the evolution of um, different, so of the dominance of different components. What do you, mean you have? Do you assume them, or where do you get this evolution from? Um, well, um, actually, so uh, it is determined uh, very much so by the uh, initial um, assumption on the distribution of Lorentz factors of the relativistic jet. So, for example. Uh, let me just show you the, uh, again, the... This may give the dynamics, but how do you get the microphysics parameters from there? I don't know if I have it here. So, for example, the examples that I've shown, uh, we have assumed such distribution of Lorentz factors, um, which would produce us a single peak uh, uh, GRB, uh, whose light curve has uh, initially um, Fast, fast rise and then exponential decay. Uh, and then also, so this uh, distribution is going to determine how this uh, evolution of um, physical conditions in the shock medium is evolving. So uh, there are the assumptions on dynamics and the assumption on microphysics that finally determine what you're going to see in the light curve um, or in the spectra. For example, here, uh, I'm showing what happens when we assume just like a step function for an initial Lorentz factor distribution. And you can see that we obtain completely different evolution. And, and so we, you, you can see the signatures in the uh, um, light curves. Also see, you, you can notice here that there are two cases for constant zeta and varying zeta. Zeta is the microphysics parameters that tells us how um, how many, so it tells us what is the uh, number fraction of electrons that are accelerated to relativistic velocities. And um, so varying zeta case means that we put it um, to be proportional to dissipated um, energy in the collision. So you see that uh, there are both uh, assumptions on dynamics and microphysics that are going to affect the final shape of uh, the spectrum and the light curves. Okay, so essentially the ultimate result depends on these assumptions, no? Yes. So the difference is also here for uh, the, the second work I presented on low luminosity GRBs. We are using a different radiative code and um, it is uh, improved with respect to all simulations as it also includes the uh, uh, effect of the secondaries. Thank you. I see the second question by Giovanni quite uh, fast because we are. Uh, mostly out of time. So please, Giovanni. Yes, uh, my question is very fast. And basically, it was uh, concerning the code that you use. And uh, I wasn't just to ask whether it uh, can be uh, available for groups who are interested to model uh, the very high energy emission of gamma ray bursts. So these are the papers in which we describe the code. And um, we are currently finishing a paper where we are updating some assumptions on microphysics. Um, so the core code has never been made uh, publicly uh, available. Um, I don't know, this is something that we can think of, think about in the future, certainly. Okay, okay. thanks uh, again, Angelica, for the very nice and comprehensive uh, uh, the presentation about these very nice uh, physics. Now we'll, uh, we thank the speaker again, and we move to the uh, current and future uh, telescope. We'll complete uh, the presentation of the EACT uh, telescope that we started on Monday with uh, the presentation of the possibilities of for gamma ray burst follow-up by CTA. So please, Alessandro, it is your turn. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, can you see my slide? I hope yes, so. Please. Go ahead. Okay. So thanks, first of all, to the organizer of this session, and thanks for inviting me and joining this uh, this this meeting. I'm going to report about the, the Cherenkov telescope array capability in gamma ray burst uh, follow-up. Uh, this presentation, uh, as you may imagine, is on behalf of a larger of a larger team, in particular the Gamma Ray Burst team belonging to the to the CTA Transient Working Group, and in particular the the people that you you can see listed here on this uh, on this in first uh, first slide. Uh, so of course I don't want to spend uh, much time on uh, on this topic, as you definitely already know, and uh, moreover you already heard about uh, about these hot topics in the in the interesting session of uh, of Monday afternoon, just let me just let let me remind that uh, after this uh, long uh, twenty years quest, uh, we finally managed to catch uh, the very energy counterpart from from gamma ray burst using the current generation of imaging atmospheric Cherenkov uh, Cherenkov telescopes. So you know, of course, that some of these results has been uh, have been already published, like uh, in the case of 1901-14C for uh, the, the, the GRB detected by, by MAGIC, and in the case of 1908-29, that is the GRB uh, detected by one, one of the GRB detected by, by S. And so you have uh, seen this, uh, the results showed in the, in the, um, in the presentation of, uh, of Monday. And some other events uh, have been announced to, to have been detected, uh, but uh, the, the publication are not yet available. So just to mention some of them, the, the GRB, the short GRB 1608-21B, 1807-20B, 2010-15A, and uh, the, 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 re the, the most recent one, the, the GRB at the end of, the, of 2020, 2012-16C. Uh, so these are already the, the sample of, of events that have been detected uh, by, by current generation of, of Cherenkov telescope. So what about the next generation? Of course, the next generation for people that are not familiar with, with this kind of instrumentation would be the, the Cherenkov telescope uh, array. So uh, CTA indeed that will represent one of the one of the main infrastructure for the very energy astrophysics in the near uh, in the near future. So in particular, it will be uh, it will be composed. It will be formed by by two array of imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescope uh, located in the in the northern hemisphere in the Canary Island of La Palma and in the southern hemisphere in the in the in the Atacama Atacama Desert. So within the array, we will have uh, three different types of telescope, uh, the so-called uh, large size telescope with a diameter of 23 meters, the medium size telescope with a di di diameter of 12 meters, and a small size telescope uh, that will have uh, um, an optical diameter, a primary mirror with an optical diameter of four meters. So in the first phase, this two array will follow the so-called alpha configuration. That is a configuration that uh, implies the presence of uh, four LST and nine MST in the northern uh, in the north array, and fourteen MST and thirty-seven SST in the in the south. This will allow, of course, an investigation on some some uh, kind of complementary science in the sense that the North Array will be mainly dedicated to extragalactic science and to transients follow up, while the South, at least in this first phase, will be mainly devoted to galactic observation and observation at very high energy, uh, uh, that means uh, above 100, uh, 100 OTB. Uh, in general, this characteristic of the two of the two array will make CTA, of course, an important step forward with respect to the current generation uh, uh, of ESCT in terms of, uh, in particular, the uh, wider energy range that will cover, brief, um, roughly speaking, from, from the 20, 20 GV up to uh, above 300 TV. And this, uh, this wide energy range we, it can be covered with a sensitivity that is uh, from five to 10 times better the current generation of Cherenkov telescope. And on top of that, of course, we have also um, a better angular resolution and a larger field, uh, field of view. Uh, let me briefly mention which is the first CTA telescope that will uh, start operation. So you can see here in the in the in this picture that is uh, on the background is a rendering, so it's a computer picture. But in the inner plot, it's a, it's an actual picture. That is the 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 first one on a picture of the LST one. That is the the first prototype of the 23 meters class diameter telescope for for CTA. 
And this is a telescope that we have in transient follow-up and in particular gamma ray burst, it's, uh, it's main scientific case. And because uh, thanks to, to its diameter, this, this telescope will have uh, will be the one covering the, the lower energy the lower energy range between uh, roughly speaking 20 GV and 200 GV, and this is uh, of course particularly important for sources like uh, gamma ray bursts that are located usually at high redshift, and so their observation may might might be negatively affected by by the EBL absorption. Uh, moreover, within the three telescope classes that I mentioned before, this LST is built to be light. So even if it's the largest telescope, it weights only uh, around 100 tons. And this will allow a fast repositioning with a speed of, uh, of the order of 180 degrees in, uh, in 20 seconds. In general, it is important to remark that this, in terms of sensitivity with respect to space-based satellite, as you can see here in this plot, we will have a, a sensitivity for a time scale of the order of, of 10 minutes that is uh, of the order of 10 to the four times better than space-based satellite in this energy range. So this will, uh, uh, this of course will, uh, it stands as a very advanced uh, um, characteristic to perform uh, uh, better with respect to satellite is short time scale signal detection. Of course, the price to pay is that uh, this is a ground-based facility with a reduced with a reduced duty cycle of the order of of, of 10 percent. Uh, within CTA, uh, Transient represents a, a key science project. Uh, that means uh, a CTA, one of the CTA science core program. And the main goal, of course, uh, is to prepare to the response of CTA to a wide range of uh, multi-wavelength and multi-messenger alert, including, of course, uh, gamma ray burst. So a list of the, the possi possible uh, uh, transients that are uh, under investigation inside the transient working group of CTA are uh, presented in this in this table that is published in this uh, uh, big uh, collaboration paper science with the Cherenkov telescope array in which we reported uh, the the foreseen and the proposed observation uh, time allocation for each of the of the GRB uh, oh sorry for each of the transient that we are uh, uh, thinking as a possible science case for for CTA. Of course, this uh, table has been initially written in uh, in 2014, and uh, of course, uh, before so the new discovery. So this number has to be of, revised somehow in the in the in the near future, taking care uh, and taking into account uh, the new discoveries since uh, 20 that we had uh, since uh, since 2014. Um, so well, actually, we can uh, argue if we still need the, the CTA observation of gamma ray bursts now that we finally catch the, the very energy emission. And of course, I don't want to, to go into the details about the theory that we, we, we heard from, from the previous speaker. But of course, as a matter of fact, uh, as it happens sometimes, uh, these new observations bring also some, uh, some new questions. And it's now not always easy right now to account all pieces of the, of the puzzle. So in particular, let me just uh, mention that for many years, we anticipated that to catch the right GRB to detect, to detect very high energy emission component. Uh, and uh, this uh, right GRB in our mind uh, was uh, somehow uh, a, a limited idea in the sense that, uh, of course, in, in, in our mind, uh, we wanted to have a bright GRB, a powerful GRB, a GAV emitter, and possibly also at, at low redshift. So this characteristic, of, of course, make a, an ideal candidate for, for, very, for very high energy emission. But today, now we know that uh, the things are probably more complicated than that what we previous that what we previously thought, and in particular, we need CTA to expand uh, to to open the possibility to start to study a new parameter space region for GRB physics. Not only the one that you can see here in this plot, that is the so-called Damati relation. So, in the in the top right of the plot, where we have, of course, the most the brightest. Uh, the brightest events that, of course, we will have uh, the possibility to, to catch with, with CTA. But as you can see already from, uh, from the discovery from, uh, from S and Magic, that we have also some uh, outsider events that stand uh, a little bit uh, out of what we previously thought as an ideal candidate for, uh, for GRB at very high energy. So the question that we want to ask is, of course, if we have uh, uh, if all the GRB has a very high energy component and why we haven't detected so far, I mean, before at least, 
uh, and in particular, we want to answer to this question that why we have some detection that somehow are expected, like uh, 1901-14-C, for instance, or 1807-20B uh, that are uh, bright, powerful, and, and, uh, and very luminous GRB, but we also have some very energy detection that uh, are uh, somehow apparently different, like in the case of 1908-29-29A. Uh, uh, so, the question is, uh, we have to, to think uh, that the parameter space, space of the possible very energy emitter GRB is much larger than we thought in the past, or uh, there are some uh, different population of, of gamma ray bursts that can, uh, can give a very energy signal. So these are the questions that CTA is uh, intent to, to answer. So what we can do with CTA? Uh, there was already some... Uh, some work in uh, 2013 in which uh, in which uh, we use some uh, uh, lat detected uh, some, we use some kind of empirical approach in which uh, some lat de detected grb were used as a kind of a template to extrapolate the expected very high energy spectrum and, and and light curve in the very high energy band so in particularly the the detection rates that we estimate in 2013 was uh, uh, following two possible spectral model for this uh, uh, for this uh, simplified population, so the two possibility of using this uh, so-called uh, bandex uh, uh, model, that means uh, an extrapolation of the band emission uh, to the very high energy range, or the so-called fixed uh, um, spectral model that uh, um, foreseen on top of the band function a power law contribution uh, with a power index of, of, of two, so in a new F new plot, something that is uh, relatively flat. Uh, and here you can see the, the, the preliminary plot that we published in, 20, in, 20, in 2013, in which we reported the, the expected detection rate as a function of one of the, of the characteristics that we, at that time, we, we were foreseen for, uh, for CTA and particularly for, for LST, like in this case on the, on the left plot, the, the energy threshold or the uh, response time to, 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 the, to the trigger for different uh, for the for the band emission that is the black curve and uh, the fixed uh, scenario that is somehow more optimistic for the GRB emission that is the blue the blue line so depending on the assumed spectral model and the array characteristic of course in any case you can see that the number were very somehow limited of the order of uh, of uh, one event per per year per array uh, depending on the assumed GRB model uh, and the array layout and, and performance. But this was then in, in 2013, so where we didn't know about, uh, about the current very high energy detection and we didn't know about uh, the characteristic uh, uh, of a CTA array that now we, we know much better. So right now there is a new theoretical approach that is under development uh, in which we are simulating uh, uh, a, a GRB population that by assuming a few intrinsic properties, like the distribution of the peak energy of the, of the events, uh, the redshift distribution, then and the, the, we, assume, of course, we assume that this uh, GRB population will follow the so-called Amati relation, so the, the, rel the relation between the, the peak energy and the, the, the equivalent isotropic energy. And uh, the distribution of this uh, GRB, this population, uh, these events will have a bulk Lorentz factor that is uh, follow a distribution that is obtained by by a sample of G of, of real GRB. So um, uh, distribution for the bulk Lorentz factor that is obtained by measuring the onset time of the afterglow for uh, for uh, for, uh, for uh, the, the GRB population. So all these uh, uh, intrinsic part property are calibrated over the, the, um, the real sample of GRB, in particular using the, the, the catalog for, uh, from, from Fermi GBM and from uh, Swift for both the long and the short uh, uh, GRB. And the name of this, uh, synth this uh, population model is called positive, that stands for uh, Population Synthesis Theory Integrated Model for Very High Energy Emission. And so once we have uh, how uh, um, GRB population calibrated over the, the, the real sample of, 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 uh, of, of observed GRB, we can uh, account for the, uh, to the provision of the theoretical expectation of the very high energy emission, so the emission in the band of, the, of, the, of CTA, of the Cherenkov telescope, by assuming some uh, 
uh, prompt and afterglow emission evaluated according to the to the stand let's say let's call it standard leptonic synchrotron plus, uh, plus synchrotron self compton model and you have heard about this model in the in the previous talk by by Jellica and also uh, at the beginning by by professor grano so here this uh, this kind of emission uh, models uh, uh, are taken into account uh, so are uh, the everything is fed with the distribution of uh, a iso uh, redshift epic uh, and uh, the, the 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 duration of, of the grb and these uh, models are used to to, um, to calculate the very high energy emission for uh, expected in, in the cta band so some uh, some correction are taken into account, in particular the synchrotron self absorption and the photo -fo photon photon annihilation for the for uh, for the prompt emission and also the Kleinishin effect that are considered also in the in the afterglow. The remaining three parameters, like the equipment, the microphysical. Five minutes, Alessandro. Five minutes. Okay, thank you, Francesco. So the remaining uh, three parameters are calibrated again uh, using the, 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 the full uh, uh, sample of, of GRB observed in other in other wave band. And here in the in the bottom plot, you can see the let's call it the luminosity function and in different uh, uh, in different uh, wavelengths. So in the X uh, optical and uh, in the lat energy band for the simulation pro simulation. Um, um population that is the the dashed line and the uh, observed population that is the, the 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 solid line so you can see the match of the of between the the simulated and the and the observed uh, population so once we have the simulated spectrum the simulated life light curve we of course have the the instrument response the appropriate uh, and the late latest version of the instrument response function for the for the CTA. All these ingredients are used to, to feed the dedicated analysis pipeline that are developed by, by the CTA collaborators. So using uh, different tools, in particular the C tools and the Gamma Pi. So we have two different pipelines. And this will allow us to, to determine the, the a robust, in a robust way the, the, the expected number of GRB that we can expect uh, um by the by a possible detection by the two array and also to optimize uh, the the possible strategy in in follow-up for uh, for the future uh, for the future observation so uh this kind of numbers i can cannot still uh, provide it because we are still discussing i can anticipate that uh, in terms of detection rate we are not talking about of course tens of of, of e event per year we are always talking about uh, about uh, some events per uh, per year per array so this will depend of course by the characteristic of the array and by the strategy that we are going to to follow and these results will be published in a, in a dedicated consortium publication that will uh, probably uh, came out uh, i hope by the end of this year but most likely for the beginning of uh, 2022 uh, just to conclude that uh, uh, what we are doing so far is uh, a work on prospect, but we are finally moving also to real observation. And here is just a slide that I grabbed from uh, my contribution, the next uh, forthcoming ICRC 2021, in which we will report about the first observation to the first follow up of transient event, in particular GRB and uh, neutrino alerts with, uh, with LST-1, so with the prototype of the 23 meters telescope in La Palma. So the telescope is sending its commissioning phase, but we are uh, gradually entering in regular scientific operations. So an initial science phase uh, is uh, starting, and uh, we are uh, we are producing already some uh, some follow up and some and some results. Uh, so I leave here my conclusion uh, because otherwise I guess I'm out of time. And thank you for uh, for your attention. Yes, uh, thanks uh, quite a lot, uh, Alessandro, for the nice presentation and the nice uh, out, let's say, for, for coming uh, results by CTA. So, Yoni, please. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the nice talk. I wanted to ask, uh, essentially, in your model, there are many uh, model parameters that uh, enter and so on. It is very nice that you calibrate according to current observations. However, probably you still cannot determine all of the model parameters uniquely and some freedom probably still remains. So in light of this, might it not make more sense instead of aiming at the one final number for the rate that you ex expect 
to instead determine the probability distribution or what is a plausible range of uh, event rates that you might uh, expect. Yes, definitely. That, this is actually a very great, uh, great, great suggestion. So um, I, I definitely agree. So I, I really think that this suggestion can be implemented in the sense that uh, uh, the detection rate as given as a, as a, as a number like this, uh, it might be of course biased by, by all the uncertainty and all the freedom parameters that are used to model this kind of, uh, this kind of population. Uh, I definitely will take into account this, uh, this suggestion. Thanks. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we thank uh, Alessandro again for his uh, nice talk. And then we'll go back uh, to the uh, Ersauer array, and we discuss about Oak uh, results uh, on uh, Monday. Mm. And today, instead, we have a very nice uh, presentation on the LASO approach to uh, GRB. So please, Liang, it is your turn now. Dr. Chen, it is uh, your turn. Um. Yes, there are some noise in the background, but I can see at least your uh, screen. So. Oh, I'm sorry about that, but I... Okay. Now better, now better. Yeah. If you are close to the microphone, it is better. Can you see my screen? No? When you start speaking, there is a noise at the beginning, but then when you continue to speak, it is nice. So start, please start and start talking and we'll see how it goes. Okay. Okay. I will start my talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Liang Chen, a PhD graduate from the Buffalo Corporation. It is my pleasure to share my work here with you. And uh, the report will be conducted by the following four parts. And major content of this report is a new method for GRB observation by LASO WCDA and also shares our preliminary data analysis and results for the quarter WCDA. Okay, let's begin my talk. As we now know, GRBs are the most energetic phenomenal since the Big Bang. They are originated from binary star markers or core collapse of massive stars. Okay, corresponding to short GRBs and the long GRBs. And the GRBs are popular objects since they are high correlation with very high energy gamma rays, high energy neutrinos, and ultra high energy cosmic rays. Much messenger observation gives strong associated with the gravitational waves. About high energy and very high energy emission in GRVs, thanks to the rare performance of Fermi Labs, it opened the high energy emission of GRVs from 2009 to 2018. 186 GRVs were observed by LATS and uh, 29 of them were observed with emission above 10 GeV. Results showed the delayed emission and external components above GeV. In the prompt state, in the prompt emission, there exists complex time-dependent evolution of energy spectrum, as you can see in GRB, the, the four GRB, as you can see in the four GRB. For the ground-based uh, experiments, the ICGs first opened very high energy emission in GRB 1901-14C, and up to now, six GRBs, six GRBs and uh, candidates were reported as the TV cuts. Observation showed similar signature with the X-ray afterglow. Since high energy and very high energy Emission were observed both in the prompt stage and the afterglow. There are keys to probe physics and magnetron from prompt to afterglow. However, for ICTs, the narrow field of view and the strict observing condition makes them difficult to catch prompt emission 
Therefore, a large field of view and all day monitoring instruments is better for DRB prompt emission. I will introduce the large high HD air shower observatory. The large high HD air shower observatory, also named LASO, is a new generation of observatory duty in Baocheng, Sichuan province. It is a very beautiful place. And the last one, one of the most uh, sensitive cosmic ray and gamma ray experiments in the world. It uh, contains four parts, uh, 5,195 electromagnetic particles, also named ED, which measure electromagnetic particles, 1,171 muon detectors, which measure muon components in the shower. Also, we call it MD. It is an MD from the came to a, which is focusing on ultra high energy gamma ray astronomy. And on the, on the, on the center, and uh, on the center is the WCDA, which measures the type of secondary particles. We will introduce it uh, next. And also show here, and also show here is the WFCA Amiant Cosmic Ray measurements. The main scientific goal of LASO contains three. So origin of galactic cosmic rays, mainly for searching for galactic cosmic ray sources by measuring the energy spectrum with an unpredicted sensitivity of one person at 100 TV, we find for characters in the galactic, in the galactic. And the energy spectrum for individual components with energy from 10 TV to 1 TV is to, is to find the cosmic ray physics. For, for example, the knee. And uh, for gamma ray astronomy, the many, many focus on TV gamma ray sources is very extended and uh, transient ones with an average extended survey of one person grab at uh, three TV. And the first is new physics frontier such as black matter, Lorentz environment violation, new physics beyond the LHC, and so on. For GRB program, the last one is mainly the, 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 the Array mainly the WCDA, it covers an area of 70, 78,000 square meters. And uh, the, we have three pool. The first pool, the first pool used 1.5 inch and 8 inch PMT to receive signals. And uh, the second and the third pool used more sensitive 3 inch and uh, 20 inch PMT, which can reduce threshold energy and uh, improve the sensitivity. And for now, the whole WCD array is in operation, showing a good performance. Here, I, I, I show one event in the WCD array. Very beautiful. Uh, WCD has an advantage of wide field of view and almost a full duty cycle. And whatever the powerful DAQ makes it uh, for WCDA to develop, to develop flexible trigger logic focusing on different physics. And for now, it has three trigger modes, single multiple trigger, pattern trigger, and the triggerless trigger. The triggerless mode store all the keys, including time, charge, and uh, position, making it possible for us to develop offline trigger. However, the high, the high energy threshold is the most uh, difficult thing to detect the GRB with WCDA. Uh, typical energy is about a TV, which is unfavorable to GRB observation since the EBL absorption. As we know, the higher the energy, the more serious the EBL absorption. Uh, what we want to do is to reduce the special energy of WCDA. And uh, you can see in this table that the red shift of 0 0.1, the GRB only covers a percent of uh, a percent of 1.7. And even at such a close distance, 
So survival probability at T we only 38 percent. Only at 100, about 100 G we so in the air absorption can be ignored. And therefore, we want to reduce the energy threshold to below 100 G. And this is very hard to accomplish for higher noise detector such as WCDA. The main problem is that we have a wide field of view. This was due to the large trigger window about 100 nanoseconds. If we reduce the trigger window, we can we can filter more noise. But at the same time, we will we will lose we will we will lose large disease sample events. And therefore, uh, how can we lower the energy threshold to about 100 G? Uh, and here we propose a new method named the line of sour trigger method. And the time and the prediction of secondary particles follows a planar formula. For the no direction stopping, such as CRBs, we can get the direct direction vector and then calculate the expected arrival time of each sheet. And after that, we can correct this and change the time to the shower front. The shower front also about one to three meters corresponding to the time period to about uh, 3 nanoseconds to 10 nanoseconds. And uh, with, uh, with a small time like this, with a small lag time as this, we can filter more noise and uh, we won't and we won't lose large things uh, and we won't large things samples of GRBs. With a time window compared to the shower thickness, we can reduce the multiplicity to four and the noise rate to below 100. You can see in the right, in the, in the bottom of the right picture, after, after the time correction, the arrival time, the, the time rate is significantly, is, is significantly smaller than, than before. We use the lost method to simulate the effective area and then calculate the energy threshold at about 40, giving a promising results. With an effective area of, of several thousand square meters at least angle below 20 degree and the energy threshold of 70 GeV. And next, uh, we estimate the sensitivity of the quarter WCA array in the right picture, also show is the Argos upper limit and the 29 GRBs with photo energy above 10 GeV. You can see that for the for the short for short GRBs, the quarter WCD has a better sensitivity than most of the less samples. And even for long GRBs, seven of them can be detected by WCDA. A very promising result. And uh, the full array will have an improvement of at least uh, four times since the, since the physical area will be larger at least uh, four times. Uh, we analyze we analyze 10 GRBs of 79 GRB samples got by WCDA, and none of them were observed a significant excess in the duration of T 19 times. And we use also three different time window to search to to search for signal in in 2.5 hours or and after the burst after the burst also no excess here is one of an example and last uh, we give 99 percent upper limit set by WCDA one you can see that for the upper limit for the upper limit in the energy range of WCDA the upper limits were higher than that of the GBM blocks. It means that for most for the for most of the GRB samples, uh, WCD has got. We can't uh, constrain. We can't constrain the flux uh, 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 well, which means that we still need bright and small distance GRB samples. And by a friendly 18 GMT to 20 GMT. The energy threshold can be reduced uh, 
the further and the severity can be improved a lot. And for jockeys with small distance, like uh, 1908, 29A, the traditional trigger mode is promising to catch them. And the WCVA array will have a promising result for future job observation. Okay, I will stop here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Lianga, also for uh, staying perfectly in time within uh, your uh, allocated minutes. So very also interesting uh, results and hopefully, let's say, with your sensitivity, we can uh, either you or Oak will catch, uh, let's say, a GRB from the ground, which uh, is uh, currently awaited at this uh, largest energy. So are there questions to Lianga? I have one uh, small question. These upper limits that you obtained uh, are obtained in which uh, time frame? On the on the prompt phase or on the uh, longer time scale? It was on the prompt phase, and we also we also do uh, the blind search with uh, with a different uh, time window, but still have no access. No. Okay, because this might be a very nice uh, opportunity for the uh, shower array that can catch it. Uh, Say the prompt while the Cherenkov imaging need to steer to, toward the GRB location. But also, since we know that the afterglow phase uh, is uh, the one emitting very high energy, you can search for also for longer duration to see if something is there. Okay, so thanks quite a lot for the, for the presentation. Are there other questions to Liang? If not, uh, we move then to the last uh, talk for this uh, session uh, from uh, Giovanni. Again, on uh, future, in this case, future um, a shower array detector. Please, Giovanni. Yes, I'm going to start my screen now. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, and uh, uh, I just need to send the slides full screen, so I guess you see the slides, so I can yes, uh, go ahead. Start. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers for inviting me in giving this talk. Uh, I am going to uh, present the prospects for a very high energy monitoring of gamma ray bursts with the, the Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory, which is a, a new facility with, that uh, is uh, currently under research to be installed in the southern hemisphere. We already have one talk on the scientific topics by Christy Engel, and uh, uh, I invite you to attend uh, the general talk about uh, the southern wide field of Yugama Observatory that uh, is planned to uh, be delivered by Jim Hinton on uh, Saturday. So, in this case, I am just focusing on uh, the details of the study that we are carrying out for uh, the scientific topic of gamma ray bursts. Uh, now, for sure, we uh, know that uh, uh, gamma ray bursts have been uh, uh, detected at a very high energy. Uh, this uh, has been a long awaited uh, discovery because several theoretical models predicted that gamma ray bursts should be intrinsically able to radiate in the very high energy regime. And in particular, we expected uh, different type of processes that uh, both during the prompt emission and during the afterglow uh, could lead to the production of uh, very high energy signals and uh, in, uh, in the best cases also uh, be um, uh, good candidates of multi-messenger uh, signals, especially for the uh, association with the gravitational wave and possibly uh, neutrino detection. What we know from the observations that uh, we uh, were carried out uh, until now is that uh, um, Fermilat was able to detect uh, an energetic component that comes, uh, appears to be uh, a separate spectral component with respect to the low energy band function and extend to uh, high energy uh, in the high energy domain without appearance of uh, intrinsic cutoffs. Um, the uh, um, 
the photons that were detected in this component uh, appear to be uh, possibly associated both with the prompt emission and with the afterglow. In the case of the afterglow, finally, um, uh, MAGIC and HES observations were able to uh, actually detect the extension of uh, this uh, component up to almost the terawatt scale, although the most energetic uh, photons that were observed are subject to the effects of extragalactic background light um, opacity, which produce a se uh, severe absorption of the most energetic photons. The intrinsic spectra, interestingly, appear to be um, uh, power law of the uh, um, spectral index close to minus two, which leads to uh, almost flat spectral energy distribution. What is most interesting is that uh, in the few cases when we have uh, simultaneous observations, uh, the um, flux which is detected in the very high energy uh, domain appears to be something that uh, um, exceeds the uh, extrapolation of the low energy spectra. So the idea is that we may use the um, observations that have been carried out by a large monitoring campaign searching for energetic emission in gamma ray bursts like the Fermi LAT uh, monitoring campaign to uh, extrapolate the expectations in the very high energy uh, domain and compare with uh, what uh, we know from uh, the currently available observations. Um, here we have a set of uh, uh, the most important uh, cases of very high energy emission that were uh, detected and announced uh, uh, by um, uh, the currently operating EACT facilities. And uh, I am putting also in gray shade the detection of uh, um, uh, this uh, classic GRB 1304-27A by Fermilat, which uh, went up to uh, the famous 95 giga electron volt photon that basically demonstrated uh, the intrinsic ability of gamma ray bursts to uh, reach the very high energy domain. Our idea is that uh, probably uh, the lack of previous detection is due to the fact that uh, the expected fluxes at these energies are very, are very um, low and therefore we need instruments with uh, large effective areas sensitive to this domain range. If we use the monitoring observations of uh, um, uh, carried out by LAT compared with uh, the uh, triggers that were uh, issued by the GBM and other triggering uh, instruments, we can estimate what is the fraction of uh, gamma ray bursts that are associated to an energetic component and try to attempt uh, uh, to extend this, uh, um, uh, this uh, population um, to the very high energy domain. Okay, uh, here is where the SWGO collaboration comes in. Uh, the SWIGO collaboration uh, is, has been uh, formed in order to install um, a monitoring instrument based on uh, uh, water Cherenkov detector arrays that should survey the southern part of uh, the sky, therefore providing a complement to the northern campaign carried out by Hawk and Lasso, and also act as a, a triggering and complementary facility to um, CTA, which um, is um, uh, expected to provide the best sensitivity in the observation uh, of uh, gamma ray bursts following up the triggers, but uh, as uh, the uh, need to uh, be um, alerted and uh, uh, point the position of uh, the, the, the transient very quickly in order to uh, collect the signal. Even uh, with this uh, uh, quick, with uh, the quickest uh, uh, estimated response, uh, there is uh, some fundamental information that we are not able to collect concerning the spectral evolution, especially in, uh, in the earliest stage and possibly in the prompt uh, emission of, the, of the, the event. Both of these uh, uh, 
domain are particularly important to constrain several theoretical uh, parameters of the gamma ray burst interpretation. Our idea is that uh, we can use the uh, observations carried out uh, by Fermilat in 10 years and collected in the second Fermilat gamma ray burst catalog to try to estimate uh, um, the expected very high energy uh, properties of gamma ray bursts, taking into account that the fact that every burst is different from the other, from the other ones in terms of uh, uh, spectral uh, uh, shape duration and redshift. In particular, the redshift is uh, uh, playing an important role because of the expected suppression of uh, very high energy photons. Our idea is that uh, if we are able to model the flux available um, at different energies uh, during different times, we can in principle, estimate what are uh, the instrumental characteristics that um, are required in order to optimally um, uh, follow the triggers related to gamma ray bursts. Of course, uh, given the very quick evolution uh, that uh, uh, high energy emission uh, has been um, uh, with which high energy emission has been observed in gamma ray bursts, we uh, uh, know that very little information is currently available uh, uh, in the uh, earliest phase of the evolution. And uh, only um, in a few very bright cases, we have a detailed uh, representation of the light curve from the uh, rising stage, while virtually no information exists on the prompt emission. Only a, a large field of view instrument with a very high duty cycle can uh, monitor in the sky in order to uh, uh, probe this domain of the um, emission. Our approach has been to uh, take the spectral and temporal characteristics of gamma ray bursts published uh, in the second Fermilat uh, um, uh, catalog of gamma ray bursts and uh, to attempt estimating the uh, fluxes available uh, above different uh, energy thresholds and uh, the evolution of these fluxes uh, with uh, uh, the shape of the light curve uh, observed by Fermilat. Our idea is to compare uh, realistic observations with the different uh, uh, instrument performance sets. And in particular, we show here uh, an ideal requirement of an instrument able to react uh, to a flux of uh, some five times 10 raised to minus nine photons per square centimeter per second in an observing time of uh, 1000 seconds and compare it with uh, the uh, expected flux of real gamma ray bursts like uh, GRB 1404-27A and simulated events like bursts that are fainter than this one but located at the same redshift or the same burst simulated at a, a larger red shift with uh, the effects of flux reduction due both to distance and EBL absorption. We see that uh, the, this flux limit is um, uh, performing quite well in almost all the cases that we uh, um, consider on the average exposure time of 10 uh, of uh, 1000 seconds. And if we assume a specific evolution of the sensitivity of the instrument uh, close to uh, the uh, square root of the available time, we see that uh, the instrument is uh, able to, uh, uh, to reach the expected flux emission from all the uh, observed and simulated events if uh, it is able to cover the earliest part of the emission when the burst is, of course, brighter. One of the problems that we need to account in order to extend this uh, study uh, to a population is that um, there is only a small fraction of event, in particular 34 uh, uh, lat detected event out of a sample of uh, 186, 
in which uh, we actually know the redshift distribution of the source and therefore we know the intrinsic uh, uh, emitted power and the luminosity. Uh, there is a huge sample of events in, for which we don't know uh, the actual redshift distribution, but we can use this population uh, in order to extract at least statistical inferences on what we expect uh, to be the redshift, the opacity effect on the very high energy uh, extension. To do this, we took uh, the um, um, fluence of the observed gamma ray bursts and we simulated uh, 1000 uh, distributions of bursts having this fluence distributed over the same redshift range uh, observed by Fermi LAT. This uh, uh, led us to um, produce a population of bursts of um, uh, specific luminosity uh, on a specific luminosity range, which is actually consistent to the one uh, observed, and uh, uh, takes into account the fact that uh, uh, there we should not predict um, um, bursts to be uh, distributed in a range uh, of uh, the parameter space where uh, LAT would not have been able to uh, observe them. And the simulation need also to cover what we know from the currently existing observation. In particular, we see that the simulation come to a region where uh, we predict uh, possible detection by currently operating EAS surveys, but while uh, um, our cuts limit, uh, um, let's say, uh, the simulation in a parameter space uh, well, we do not expect much more dramatic uh, consequences on the Earth. <laughs> so, uh, the, the reason to use uh, the, this uh, approach is that uh, uh, the simulations calibrated over the isotropic energy emission take into account all the signal which is uh, uh, recorded by the LAT and therefore do not, uh, are not severely affected by uh, effects of um, uh, um, extrapolation for uh, um, bursts that were covered only uh, for a very short um, time uh, of uh, LAT signal duration. Our purpose, once we have... Five minutes, uh, Giovanni, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Our purpose, once we have uh, um, a distribution of realistic, uh, uh, of real and realistic simulated bursts, is to compare the expected um, very high energy flux, fluxes with a set of instruments performances that uh, basically bracket what we expect to be the final uh, uh, performance of the um, uh, Swigo array. We base our simulation on a reference performance which simulates five sigma detections for an array of a water Cherenkov detector covering 80,000 square meter with very high filling factor. And we account for the uncertainties due to uh, variations of sensitivity in different positions of the field of view. Uh, by alterating uh, this uh, reference uh, um, sensitivity and uh, the energy threshold uh, above which we are able to detect uh, photons. Our approach is to compare for every real and simulated burst uh, the fluxes that we expect with the uh, the corresponding uh, instrument sensitivities adopted uh, as a function of time. And uh, in particular, we can evaluate once we know the spectrum, the light curve, and uh, the duration of every burst, we can compare it, uh, it with uh, the sensitivity of different, uh, the integrated sensitivity of a different uh, adopted array with the different energy threshold checking in which uh, uh, 
amount of time we get um, uh, the, um, the detection in the sense that we accumulate more flux than the one which is required by the corresponding instrument uh, um, configuration. And we see that for all the real cases, we uh, have very promising detection possibilities, even with quite short detection time here for the GRBs like 1404-27A, we are staying below 10 seconds. Um, the, um, the situation is, of course, uh, different when we go to simulate less optimistic cases, but we see that an array which is able to perform down to at least 125 giga electron volt is still able to uh, access simulated faint GRBs and therefore increase the detection rate uh, uh, possibilities. As a final uh, remark, we can uh, um, conclude that uh, um, the combined operation of uh, Lasso and Swigo will uh, therefore uh, result in a nearly all sky uh, coverage of the very high energy um, um, emission, which will uh, represent a fundamental uh, way to uh, improve our knowledge of uh, the very early and possible prompt very high energy properties of gamma ray bursts, leading also to uh, plug a, a fundamental uh, uh, additional piece in the search for uh, multi-messenger event triggers, because uh, the ability to trigger on a very high energy emission and to um, provide um, uh, reliable uh, locations uh, to, towards the source will definitely help uh, the search of um, uh, potential association with the, um, uh, other alerts coming, for example, from particle and gravitational wave detector, and further drive the follow-up campaigns uh, of um, other instruments that will need to point to the region in order to uh, collect all uh, the required information. With this, uh, I am um, over. Um, I will uh, be happy to answer your questions and, and uh, listen to your comments if you have any. And, well, thanks, uh, Giovanni. Yes. for the nice presentation. I have uh, one question and uh, let's say one uh, request then afterwards. So the question is, uh, the, when you showed the uh, plot uh, with uh, the Earth, uh, let's say this, this uh, instrument, uh, okay. you yeah. mentioned this nice satellite by Yoke. Have you compared uh, their sensitivity to say that uh, with the, the actual sensitivity they can detect up to that uh, flux or how you estimate the second error on the plot. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, right now, right now, this is uh, this part is not completely scientific, but uh, there is uh, a comparison of uh, uh, the instrument performance with Hawk, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, estimated that the best uh, lumin, uh, yes, the, the the most luminous luminous uh, burst. Uh, uh, that uh, we consider in our population, if they occur at a low enough redshift and, of course, fall in the um, uh, footprint of the sky which Hawk is observing, they should pot potentially be detected. And this is in agreement okay. which, with what has been stated elsewhere. So okay. this one is not uh, really um, oh, no, no, okay, uh, okay. Yes, okay. a scientific, okay. but uh, the point is that uh, in this region, we expect uh, that uh, Hawk should be able to react. But these bursts are so rare, uh, let's say, uh, according to our estimate, that this is consistent with the fact that Hawk has not yet detected any. No, and okay, in this plot, the red dots are not the one expected to be detected by Zwigo, but they are the one detected ah, by yeah, uh, No, no, okay. this one are the, 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 the ones the, with the yes. uh, known uh, red shift. Red shift and, okay. and uh, the request that I have is that, uh, have you, I, I, I might have missed it, uh, have you said something when Zwigo can be started to take operation or this will be, we have to wait until... Oh, okay, to, uh, uh, no, I... <laughs> I think that uh, the the, um, uh, the 
correct answer will come from the full Swigo presentation, but we have some orders of magnitude concerning the current stage, which should come with a final design with all details proposed by 2025. And the instrument should be in the best of all possible words, I think, because we have need to take into account that not everything is under our control. The instrument should be uh, operating and taking data by 2030, as more or less. Okay, thanks, uh, Giovanni. Are there other uh, questions to him? Okay, so if not, uh, this uh, closes our uh, two session on high energy and very high energy emission from gamma ray burst. And uh, on Monday, uh, Alessio remembered that uh, the two years ago when I organized a similar session, he was mentioning that no uh, very high energy detection happened at to that time. It was in July, 2015. <laughs> so hopefully this session will have the same uh, fate for detectors that haven't not yet detected the very high energy emission from gamma ray burst. If, uh, if yes, let's say next time we will celebrate also the other detectors, but I hope that this will be possible very soon. Just, uh, just it is a, a joke, of course, but uh, let's say we'll uh, um, invite uh, all of you to contribute to the proceedings. The proceedings will be published electronically and also, uh, um, let's say, in print by um, World Scientific. And all uh, of the contributors can have quite a large uh, number of pages, uh, different from other conferences. We will have up to 20 pages uh, in World Scientific. So we, we will give you the, the, somehow the instruction for the proceedings uh, afterwards. In the meantime, I will uh, invite Fabian in case to say something, and then we'll close. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for the really nice presentations and the nice discussion and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, so thanks and see you at least in two years from now for another uh, splinter session on these very interesting topics. Thanks for attending and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.